Thank you. Oh. Jojo. Hey, how are you? Everybody Good. loves Jojo. <gasps> Yes, but as for items not on the agenda, you know so why? the late start will probably be starting around 8 or 8, 10, John? Not around that. 10 of 8. 10 of 8, no. I think. 10 of 8. 10 of 8. After, after the presentation and the discussion, yeah. According, yeah, standard practice. We signed a letter. I mean, you, we got to go in exactly. We'll call the school committee meeting to order um, on December 6, 2018. Um... Just read that. Madam Chair, uh, I'd like to move move that we go into executive session to protect the bargain, bargaining position of the board. Move and move into executive session to, to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining and re, to return to open session at approximately 7 p.m. All those in favor, or do we get a roll second? Call. You got to do roll call. Yes. Second. Second. Roll call. Yes. Ms. Yes. Robinson. Yes. Dr. Doxer, yes. Mrs. Webb, yes. Okay, so we will.
to call the um, December 6, 2018 school committee meeting back to order. Um, we are we are going to take if there's any public comment for items that are not on the agenda tonight we take those now always at the beginning of the meeting um, is there any comment okay um, so we will i am going to pull the capital plan up in front of the reports tonight and in front of our consent agenda and because uh, we have uh, Joe Huggins here. I don't know if the town manager is still here. Because um, they're, they're here specifically for that. And then we will go back and do our consent agenda and reports and then go into our new business, which is the late start and superintendent's goals. And we will, uh, just so that people understand, there's a sign-in sheet in the back. Um, if people do want to speak um, during the agenda item, I know there's, there's been some discussion on the late start. We will, that will be part of uh, that agenda item. We'll hear the presentation um, from uh, Christine Kelly and the late start team. And then the school committee will begin um, some dialogue and discussion about it. And we will, at that point, um, allow and uh, I'll, uh, call the public that would like to speak um, the school committee is not voting on that topic this evening so without further I'd like to get the um, we'll do the capital piece Are you guys ready because I, I, I was, we're ready all right Can we have enough seats? thank you To kick it off, it, included in the school committee packet that went out is an updated FY19 capital plan as it relates to the schools. Um, the only change to this is that we have reflected the $200,000 that was requested by the Finance Committee at the Financial Forum on October 10th and subsequently approved by town meeting on November 15th, and the $200,000 relates to us going out to secure design services specifically related to turf two we are asking the school committee to approve the fy19 capital plan as it relates to the schools as amended and approved by town meeting we also wanted to let the committee know that um, the town manager while he is here tonight to help answer any questions that may come up regard, regarding the capital plan will be presenting the capital plan the current year as well as the 10-year plan next week um, on December 11th to the select board. Mr. Robinson and I believe Mrs. Webb will be attending that meeting to represent the school committee as well as myself, Dr. Doherty, Joe and Kevin will also be attending to assist in any questions that come up. In addition to that, as part of next week's board of select board meeting, they will also be discussing the insurance plans. They will have a presentation being done at that time as well, so we wanted to let the committee be aware of that. During the January school budget meetings that we will be having with the school committee, we will be providing the committee with updates and developments as they relate specifically to the capital plan for the current year as well as the items that just got approved as part of town meeting. We don't anticipate having a lot of updates within the next couple of weeks, but as the updates become available, we will be presenting the information to the committee and working closely with the town manager updating the select board as well. We have asked Joe Huggins to be here this evening to provide an overall update on the FY19 capital plan, the items that had been previously approved, as well as a quick update on the next steps on the additional items that have been approved. So I'm not sure if we want to hear the updates first and vote to approve it or take the vote and then hear the updates. We'll hear the vote, the updates. Hear the updates right. first. And then. So uh, this year in the capital plan, um, I'll just go through what we've completed so far um, at the different locations. So we had money in the capital plan, $40,000 here at the Reading Memorial High School for carpeting, and we've got that project just about complete. We have some remaining um, carpeting to do, which we're gonna do in the next two weeks in this building. Uh, the other school that we had money uh, for carpeting is was the Parker Middle School. Uh, that was $15,000, and that project has been completely, uh, completely done. 
Also within the capital plan, we have um, a project to replace a hot water boiler um, at the Coolidge Middle School, $30,000 job, and we are that the unit is on order, and we're hoping to get that done also over the Christmas vacation uh, when school is out of session. Um, the next two projects, one would be the um, wood end skylight project that we uh, completed about a month and a half ago. Um, that project was an original budget estimate of 480000 It came in at uh, a competitive bid at $219,000 um, with no change orders, and the project is done. It came out really nice. Wow. We were able to get the product awesome. that we spec'd, um, and so we're all pretty happy about that. Um, That's excellent. I really, you guys, that kudos because that was um, very challenging. Everything was late and we were up against it. So that's just outstanding. Yeah, it ended up coming out. It was a little snowstorm. Dicey in the end. So, but we finished it before <laughs> the snow from the yeah. morning. So, which is good. Um, the next one is on up the allocation we had for the uh, replacement of one of the boilers here at the high school. Um, $575,000 project went out for competitive bid also. Um, that came in at 493000 <laughs> just just under that, 493 We have money left over in the capital plan that we're going to use as contingency money as well as to do some electrical um, and controls work. Um, the Originally, we were going to pull one of the, boil the boiler to be placed offline and do the work over the winter. We did, we've signed the contract. Um, the design is obviously done. We've uh, taken ownership of the boilers. They're being stored right now. We're going to do the work in May with a completion date of no later than August 1st. Um, the reason for that is we did not want to take, um, take a chance with having only one boiler in the build. So that was the reason we did that. So that project is also well underway. The items that were added to the capital plan, um, one of them is the 227500 for um, a, uh, enrollment slash master plan study. Mm -hmm. um, we are in the process. We actually put out a uh, request for qualifications through the uh, town procurement office and had a good response, received uh, four, uh, four companies that have bid on it. There is a... Um, evaluation team that's been set up. It's made up of myself, Gail Dowd, Kevin Cabuzzi, as well as the uh, Chief Procurement Officer, Allison Jenkins. And we're in the process of evaluating those right now. We're anticipating having an award done uh, and negotiating with the contractor for the fee structure within the next two to three weeks, sometime right after the new year, mm -hmm. so that we can get that enrollment study slash master plan started. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Um, the uh, next one is the um, the Turf 2 um, project. Um, we um, have, uh, that's a little bit different. It's not Chapter 149. It falls under a different uh, Mass General Law. It's Chapter 3039, which um, has a different structuring, the way you can choose a design team. So we're, we've partnered up with the uh, engineering department at the DPW. Um, and we've got it narrowed down to a company that um, specializes in turf field uh, installations and turf, inst uh, turf field design. Um, we're planning on walking next week with them, um, with DPW folks, and then hopefully shortly thereafter we will be able to uh, negotiate with uh, that and we'll bring everybody, they'll bring the whole team and we're going to be involved and obviously it's going to involve schools, recreation, facilities and DPW, because mm -hmm. there's going to be input we need from all those groups. So we're working on that simultaneously. The last one is the um, the $500,000 that's in there for the, um, for the security. And in order for us to even take the first step forward, the capital plan was amended to include OPM slash design services. We are required to hire an OPM first. So the uh, procurement office is working on getting a um, package together to go out to hire a uh, owner's project manager. The owner's project manager's role is to assist the town in choosing a design firm. They need to be in, in, in place before we spend dollar one on the design. That's, mm -hmm. that's the law. So we're also working on that project right now. That's it. Mr. Robinson. So 
Thank, thank you, Joe. I just have a few questions on the, actually just going down, on the uh, HVAC energy management. Where are we with, do we, do we get any updates or is it the whole Noresco thing? Cause so that was what, seven years ago now or something that yeah. we did the end? We're in, right now we're in a 15, a 15 year agreement with Noresco uh, through with, with something called measurement verification. And basically what they do is they come out to verify, um, it was 2009 actually um, that we did that project. Um, we start off with a baseline before we did any of the energy conservation measures, and then we implemented them. And the trend, and it's, we've been saving money off the baseline since the project has started. And it's actually, the, we've exceeded the savings as far as consumption goes, costs go up. Right. We've exceeded the savings. The reason we pay for energy, uh, measurement verification is to verify that we are meeting the agreement and to also make sure that if, if it went the other way and the overall savings wasn't there and it was something that was, let's say, their fault, they, they refund us. Right. However, if the town is not maintaining their equipment, they ask us for proof every year to send us all of our reports and all of our PM records and everything. If we don't do our end, they won't, they won't guarantee it. So it's, it's kind of like a two-part thing. They're making sure that what, what they put in works, and we're making sure that we're, you know, we're maintaining the equipment so that we meet the savings, if you will. So we didn't, I think I'm trying to remember, we didn't do all of the lighting at the time because no. it was expensive. Does some we, of this extra, I don't call it extra, but this where we came in under budget, with the boiler, can we redeploy some of that money to the, some of the lighting we didn't do? Or, or? Well, so the, at the time we did um, a lot of uh, light sensors in a lot of spaces in all the buildings, town-wide, school-wide. We did light, light sensors and we did high efficiency T8s. We looked into LED lighting at right. the time. It was way too expensive to do it. Not the now, though, it isn't. Yeah. Correct. So since that time, um, just so you're aware, we've done um, we took advantage of an RMLD uh, rebate and we did the common areas and the two big meeting rooms at Town Hall with LEDs. Um, Joshua Eaton, we did the same thing. Uh, we're in the process right now of doing uh, work. We did some work at Birch Meadow, correct? Um, LED light fixtures <coughs> over there. We're also in the process of um, doing uh, a lighting upgrade at the DPW garage, and the next one we're gonna hit is the field house with all LED fixtures. And we're hoping that to be able to get to that within our operating budget. There's some huge savings going on right now with um, Standard Electric, I believe it is, that's offering, you can buy these things for a fr the fraction of a cost, as long as you can put them in within a determinable amount of time. So, to answer your, qu your question, if we were going to do another performance contracting initiative, it would be an LED project. Right. That's where we would, because that's the biggest savings. That's that's the way to go. Yeah. Sure. Uh, what's in general? This maybe goes to John uh, on the elementary planning study. Does that what's the shelf life or something like? Because I mean, we might not just start using it right away. Uh, how long does that something like that last us? Because I know it's been, what, 10 years now? You're talking about the enrollment piece. Yeah, the enrollment. I'm sorry. The enrollment. Yeah, the, en the enrollment piece, um, I mean, we haven't had one since 2001. Right. Uh, so I, I think it's going to, it'll have a decent shelf life because we'll be able to use that data because um, enrollment studies project out a good 10 plus years. And they're going to look at what is current, the, the current developments that are going on in the town and any potential future developments that are in the books right now. So I th it'll give us good information. Okay. And then this is my last Yeah, it's uh, You mentioned, Joe, uh, security. I didn't see that in the in yeah. hearing. The security is actually um, under the, it's under the core, but it's under the town side. It does not fall directly under the school, so it, it's not something that the school committee needs to vote on, but we will be keeping both the town side and the school side as updated as we can given the nature of the project. So we just, since it's come up in multiple meetings, we wanted to give an overall mm -hmm. update, but that is under the capital, on, on, the, core. Of the, on the town side. Okay. The town you. core. Town core. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Oxer. Um, 
I had a question. You ran through who's on the team for the elementary schools. I didn't keep up with who you said was on the team. Oh, it's just it's no, just No, this is just to pick a we have we're going to be hiring an on-call architectural services firm or a house doctor. Which is what And um, in order to do that, we need to evaluate the the proposals. Now, once that's done, it's going to take then there'll be another group of people that's involved. That's There'll be things that the facilities okay. department needs to include, you know, because they're going to ask for a lot of information. There'll be information transfer going from our department, from me and Kevin, but it'll be school department. So I don't know what John and Gail have d decided who that's going to be, but we'll assist, but it'll be taken care of like that. That's what I hadn't yep. heard, so thank yeah. you. Yeah. This is just for the We're chapter not at that 30, point, yeah. 39. Yeah, we just need to get, we yeah. just need to retain services first. Now, is the PBC? Uh, likely to be involved at that step or no not yet no, no. it's the outcome no. of that after the outcome of once we choose if you right once there's an actual yeah. project in place exactly. then that's when they engage okay. I, have, I have a yep. request just from hearing other folks too when we use our alphabet soup it might be good to speak the out what it stands yeah. for permanent building committee I was asking but so the permanent building committee will be engaged in the process after the the planning and program and enrollment, that whole evaluation, and to Mr. Robinson's point, asking about shelf life, depending upon how long that takes, that could be a year, it could be two years, but at whenever that is completed and that group decides there's a project, then the permanent building committee would become engaged in the project, and the school committee is not solely responsible for building buildings again. Thank goodness. That's correct. Oh, Mr. Bond. So I wanted to return to a couple numbers I thought I heard Joe and Gail, but correct me if I don't have this right. So we, as a committee, had approved, it was a 480000 for the skylight it would end? Does that sound right? Correct. And that came in at, you said, 219? 219. So that's 261000 if I type my numbers in my calculator correctly. So what happens to that 261000 we approved and didn't use? That money we are not able to reallocate. We would work with, if there was another capital need or other need, we would work with the town manager. It was approved through town meetings specifically mm -hmm. for that purpose. So similar to some of the other changes, it mm -hmm. would go through that process, either returning to free cash or being reallocated through working with the town manager through the town meeting process. Okay, so we do have a new need tonight. It is a capital need, and it's less than 261,000. It's turf two for 200,000, right? Turf two, the design services were approved as a capital item through the last town meeting. Right, so what's the difference between the 200,000 that we have, that we're being asked to vote? That's the only change in the capital plan that we haven't already voted on tonight, right? And the wood end skylights were actually part of the FY18 capital plan, not the okay. FY19. So they're two fiscal. That's so that, fiscally yeah. so that money years. doesn't can't be accessed no. in, in this that vote. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure we yeah. weren't voting twice. Like, if, if we already had money for capital expense, I didn't want to vote another 200000 if there was already 200 plus thousand so available. The wood end skylights were approved as part of last year's capital plan. It's just the, the planning, the timing, the contracting, and the actual work being completed. And until we were sure there were no contingencies or any other items that came up, we didn't know the definitive access that we have. And again, that was FY18 funding. So the, the turf two work we're talking about is going to be completed in the FY19 year. The turf too. This is F design. Just I, sure. just, I, design. I just said work. Yeah. That's yes. all I said. Is work. Yeah. Yes. Design. Could be any design work. That is Thank the you. goal. Okay. Yep, yeah. Mr. Robinson. Uh, uh, just another question on the design. So, I, I believe part most of that is because we're looking at maybe extending. The field, or John, or I don't know if Tom's here somewhere, probably uh, extending the feet, making it so you can play different events there that we can't now. That's because you really don't need a design study to, to, to repair it, right? So part of what we will be doing is looking at multiple scenarios based upon the feedback that we've heard at the financial forum as well as the town meeting is looking at turf two, currently looking at 
extending it with width and length right. also looking at the fencing as well as the turf two lights so we're basically going to look at various <coughs> scenarios to determine the various pricing differentials between them to make sure that we're making the right decision so overall that, that's from a that's the lion's share of the design if we had just decided just to repair it we wouldn't be spending 200 yeah but the, the <coughs> Mr. Hagen. The, the issue with that is that you would really not want to, it's not just as simple as rolling up the turf and then having some new turf rolled out. It's, it really is looking at what's underneath it and looking at the play surface itself and then looking at the, the substrate, I guess I'll call it, what's underneath and the matting material. Um, that's all going to be upgraded. And in order for us to competitively bid it, we need to be really precise on what we put out on the street. And so you either pay for it now, lack of a better word, or you pay later. And I've seen that happen before. People don't do the right thing, and, and that's it, it's kind of a, it's like a belts and suspenders approach. You, you really, to put it out to bid in this market, you really got to be very precise on what you're putting out and what your expectations are. So, I, I mean, I know I. I, I know it's not your fault. I, it, and John's heard me say this a million. It drives me crazy that we aren't even out to bid yet. But whoever's picking up the bid package knows what we're authorizing to pay I, for it. I mean, it's you know, but kind of I'll, what I'll tell you. Let me, let me just say uh, one thing about that. It's the same thing with the wood end skylights. Yeah, People yes, knew what yeah, that was, and we came in under bid. Right. Yeah. It's still good point. Bit. And the same thing with the boilers. It doesn't always mean that you're going to spend extra, but you, you, you're right. I mean, who, we, we don't know what the bidding market's going to be like when we put it out to bid. It could be that there's not a lot of people, that there's not a lot bidding on the work and it could drive the price yeah. up. You don't know. And this, but that's also another reason to have a good set of design specs put together yeah. for it. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I was going to say they got a huge savings with the competitive bidding process before, and, and hopefully that continues. Um, just to put this in context, the design amount of the 200000 Joe, I, the last time when we built Turf 2 originally, I don't, several years ago, I know, I mean, just order of magnitude of what these fields cost. My sense is that this is less or around, maybe it's around 5 to 10 percent of the cost of, of the full project. Is, is that a fair rule of thumb Usually or Usually the way design off? fee without the construction administration runs 10 percent of the project. Yeah. So that, that's my guess. So, it's, so this, is, this is smart money in the sense that yeah. you're trying to wisely spend the next 90 percent of your investment in this facility. So I see it as, as going slow to go yeah. big or go, go better. And, and to get the most out of those fields, if we can use them for more purposes, uh, I think that only adds flexibility because we're, we're cramped as a town in terms of playing fields and time, I know. Yeah. So if we can get more out of that site, I think that benefits everyone. So I'm, I'm in favor of this. Thanks. I just would like to add, so along those lines, though, then we have to make sure that if we're using the fields more, we have to pay, we have to maintain them. And it costs more to maintain a field that's used more. So yeah. there's both, you know, it does both sure. things. So, you know, that, that piece of it has to be covered and I don't know I'm and we will be covering sort of the ongoing maintenance we won't know the ongoing maintenance of these fields but as Joe comes in in January to present the school facilities as well as what has been presented on the town side we'll be able to talk to and what some that of means. the in expense right. increases associated with the field maintenance mm -hmm. great so I think we need to let's put the motion on the floor Move to approve the revised and amended FY 2019 capital plan as presented. Seconded by Mr. Robinson. Is there any further discussion? Nope. All those in favor? And 4 0, the motion carries. Mr. Huggins, Mr. Rala Shar, Luzi, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Okay, um, we're going to go back to our consent agenda, and um, <coughs> I think I need to ask if anybody has any items that they wanted removed from the consent agenda. I don't see any. Um, I would just like to 
I just want to highlight there was uh, uh, an, our appreciation of the support of our community for our schools. There was a considerable amount of donations here tonight. They actually total a little over $21,000. And there's $5,030 for the arts. There's $6,500 in there for academic programs, $1,770 for field trips, and about $7,890 for uh, coaching. So we really appreciate um, all of the organizations. Many of these are friends of, uh, of soccer, of theater, of, of science, of, of football. Um, of, that was a chamber. Um, and also community organizations that um, really support our schools and uh, support really our ability to provide our students with uh, strong academic programming as well as um, co and extracurricular. So we appreciate that. Can you put the motion on the table? Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Um, second by Mr. Bobbin. All those in favor? And that's 4-0. Excellent. Okay, um, we're going to do reports. So usually we'll start with our student. Do you have anything for us this yeah, evening? Yeah, I do. Okay, great. So it's been really busy these last couple of weeks. Uh, a lot of sports are starting. So Drama Club performed six outstanding shows of Mamma Mia. The audience was out of their chairs singing in the finale. So it was a ton of fun. Um, again, the RMHS girls swim and dive team are state champions, so that was really exciting. And then just last, a couple weeks ago, RMHS showed their school spirit at the Thanksgiving pep rally. An exciting game, the football team then went on to bring the Thanksgiving trophy back to Reading, so that was awesome. And then these last couple weeks we had sports tryouts finishing and games are beginning this weekend. And then going for the arts, we have the jazz band, stage band, and chorus. They're going to have their free winter concerts next week. And those are going to be a ton of fun. And then auditions occurred for the two winter shows, Chronicles of Jane, Book 7, and Selfie. So the cast list came out, and rehearsals are going to begin for those two. Thank you. And actually, we don't have our director of student services, so. Um Dr. Darty and our assistant superintendent. Gail, you're all done, right? I gave my update. Okay, so I don't know if Chris has additional. I reports. don't have any additional. <laughs> I'm going to wait until uh, my presentation. Okay, great. Dr. Darty? I have a couple of things. Um, first, and this was sent out today to Birch Meadow families, and we'll be sending out some additional correspondence um, to the rest of the community um, in, uh, coming up that unfortunately we did have another school graffiti uh, incident. This time it was in the boys bathroom uh, across from the cafeteria at the Birch Meadow Elementary School. It was a um, racist graffiti, um, included multiple multiple prof profanities. Uh, first it was, it was found around uh, three o'clock by a, our extended day staff. Um, we went through the protocol that we have put in place and unfortunately have been using several times um, in the last several weeks. Uh, police were notified, facilities was notified. Um, Principal Hendricks uh, notified me. We, uh, photographs were taken. Um, it was, it's in the middle of an investigation of students, police, and administration are, are investigating it. Um, Mrs. Hendricks wrote an excellent letter today that was sent out to the community. Um, I just want to I just want to read one paragraph that I think is really uh, telling. In light of the events at the Midland High School where racist and hate speech have been written on walls, it is important that we take these incidents seriously. Elementary school age children say words or phrases that they overhear and may not understand. They do not intend to cause harm or injure others with this language. However, if it is not addressed, they will never understand the harm and damage racist language can cause. At Birch Matter, we are absolutely committed to living our core values, and these values do not align with our racist or hate speech. So there are, there are things that all of our schools are putting in place, obviously, and have already had in place, and Birch Meadow is no exception. Um, I know that Principal Hendricks takes this very seriously and um, has already discussed things with staff. I know that they actually had a conversation prior to this with her school council uh, Monday, ironically, about 
about the different incidents that have been happening in our community. So I uh, wanted to report that out this evening. Obviously, this is not acceptable um, in our community, and we're going to do everything we can to educate um, our students um, on what is appropriate behavior. So that, that was my main point. Um, moving on to some things that are a little bit more positive. Um, we have two students uh, at Reading Memorial High School, this was in, in the newsletter that um, sent out this week, who have been chosen for what is called the All Eastern Honors Choir. Uh, this is a major uh, achievement. This, uh, we, we have several students that do very well in band and chorus recognition regionally um, every single year. But these two students, Antonio Ruiz Noakes and Isabel Molitieri, um, have been selected to participate in the 2019 NAFME All Eastern Honors Women's Choir and Mixed Choir. And what this means is that they are competing against top musicians from Connecticut, Washington, D.C., Delaware, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, uh, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, Vermont. And they are now going to be participating April 4th through 7th um, in performing and rehearsing in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania as a result of being selected. So this, this is obviously an amazing achievement. Um, I want to congratulate these two students and also Kristen Killian, who has worked with these students for these last four years um, to, to give them the, you know, to get the skills out of them that they, they're, they're truly showing. So I wanted to mention that. I also wanted to mention that um, I had the opportunity, I know um, others did as well, uh, attending the Festival of the Trees this weekend. This is the Reading Education Foundation each year, and it, as always, it did not disappoint. Um, and there's, a, there's something there for everyone. Not only do we have the, the beautiful and creative trees um, that many of our organizations and our schools put together each year, um, but also we have very, very talented festival performances, ranging from school performances, um, like our chorus, our high school chorus and middle school chorus, um, jazz band, but also community uh, uh, performance as well, our Colonial Chorus, uh, the Community Concert Band, Reading Community Concert Band also played. Um, so it, it really is just an amazing event each year. It's, it's definitely become part of our community. I don't know how many years it's now been, but it's, it's been oh, several years. And I just want to, yeah, it's, it's 16. 16 years. So I want to thank the Reading Education Foundation for putting this on. I also want to thank the Reading Rotary Club, who sold the refreshments and then donated the proceeds um, back to REF um, throughout the entire weekend. Um, and I know that they, there was a lot of people there, so I'm sure they raised a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll, our teachers will be reaping the benefits from that through the grants, and our kids certainly will benefit as well. So, um, and those those are my two. Right, Doctor, do you um, also recognize some students at town meeting, um, the MASS award? So that was I did. excellent recognition for two of our students. Great. Three. Three, great. three students. Three That's students. Right. It's usually two, but it was three. It was three this year. Um, so that was excellent to, for their strong academic achievement, and it's quite an honor for them and their families to be there at town meeting. Okay, uh, do I have reports from committee members? Mr. Robinson. So I attended uh, two uh, recreation committee meetings, <coughs> and the reason for the two meetings was that the Reading Little League softball uh, had put a donation to redo Sturgis Park, and we met with them and agreed. Uh, went along with the plans. I think it's probably a lot of the work's already been done. Uh, but the, the wonderful thing about that was they did that all on their own, out of their, uh, they used their own money. They didn't go, go they, it was all in kind uh, work. And it's being designed to look like Morton Field with the dugouts and new backstops of the, uh, Little League softball. It was, uh, I guess, it's been very successful program. So, uh, the other thing I wanted to report on is uh, I went attended the uh, 
football luncheon uh, the mm -hmm. day before Thanksgiving, and uh, you know, our, our I just I'm so proud of uh, all of our boys get up and give speeches, and they just do a great job, and and you know what what our coaching staff does with them. I mean, it's just the it, you know they're uh, just impressive. Uh, mm -hmm. And do a great job, and you know, look, look great. So it's a good, good event. Thank you. Fun we appreciate event. you representing the committee and attending the lunch. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Dr. Doxer. Before Dr. Doxer goes, I just want to acknowledge that um, on behalf of the committee, Dr. Doxer did a tremendous amount of the work to organize the school committee's um, snowman presentation at the Festival of Trees, and that was on behalf of the committee and the central office. And I want to thank Dr. Doxer for her work uh, doing that. It was fun, actually. Yeah. And you, yeah. oh, go ahead. Thank you. Have you. Other and reports. thanks to everybody that bought raffle tickets to put in the bucket. It was pretty full, so that That's was awesome. Um, some great books. Thanks to White Land Books. <laughs> um, so I have two reports. Um, one is for RACASA, and one is I had the great opportunity to go to the Massachusetts Association of School Committees and Mass Superintendents Conference in November. So the first, um, the first report is um, RACASA. So last Thursday, November 29th, um, we were updated on the what's happening and learned that Julianne DeAngelis, who has devoted her heart and soul to our town, the outreach coordinator, is going to be retiring. So um, it's bittersweet because she's wonderful and we wish her all the best, but she's been great here. Um, and another thing we learned was that after 10 years, and this was followed up with a meeting with the select board last night, um, after 10 years of grant funding, RACASA is going to be town funded. Um, hopefully at the end of this budget cycle, it will be voted in, so as an accommodated cost. And that will enable us to have the director and go back to having a full-time outreach coordinator. Um, and that will really help them in all of the programs that they're working so hard to do. Um, and those programs include um, Julianne, our outreach coordinator, has been working with the high school on the ESPERT, which means screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. So she's been there with our nurses at the high school, um, um, making sure that of uh, doing the state mandated evaluation screening so that we can catch problems and refer kids for supports before they become um, bigger problems. Also, um, they've been offering adult and youth first aid and it's really amazing that they've trained over 750 people at this point. So that's 750 more people out there <coughs> in our schools. Every new teacher is required to do this. So all those people are more sensitive and trained in terms of what to do should they spot mental health issues arising or evolving. Um, they also are recruiting now for a student uh, a high school student outreach team, and that team's going to go into the middle schools to teach about the dangers of vaping, which I think we all can recognize as an increasing problem. So engaging our kids in reaching out to other kids is a really powerful mechanism, and I can attest to that myself because I have two kids that were RACASA ambassadors, and they continue to do that work. So that's very exciting. Um, they also have joined the Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition to work with um, educating parents of middle schools on how to talk to their children about substance abuse prevention. And they were part of the alcohol compliance that turned out 100% compliance in town. So that's not always the case. It was really a feather in our police and our town business's hat. Um, Erica McNamara has also oh, been working to educate herself and just went to a really exciting conference for two days on the science of the positive, which will, um, they're going to develop programs that come from looking, pro being proactive and looking positively um, for approaches um, to changing culture and attitudes in addressing mental health and substance use challenges. 
So, um, so it's very exciting. I'm glad to be a part of. Thank you. And the. Um, so for the report, there's no way to capture what I experienced at the Mass Association of School Committees conference in, in five minutes. So um, I've written a little something up that's going to be um, at the end of the packet. Um, but in a nutshell, just to explain to folks, um, we have a little bit of a professional development budget for the school committee. So all that's paid for is the registration. Everything else comes from the school committee members who go. So we pay for our hotel, we pay for our um, meals, any speakers, that stuff. And I must say that um, being frugal really paid off for me because I shared a room with um, the vice chair of the Burlington School Committee. And I learned so much from her and from the people she introduced me to. And that's really what it's about. It's about stretching our wings and our minds and hearing and meeting other people from other committees and knowing and realizing that what we think is the only way is one way and that there are other ways to approach things. Um, and that's really liberating and really empowering. And I really appreciated the funding for the registration to be able to go to that. Um, the first workshop I went to uh, was really liberating because it was Aaron Polanski who has presented here. And uh, he's all about relationships, 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 and connections. And we see a lot of that happening in Reading with um, our teachers connecting with our students and, and the efforts to make sure that um, every student has a teacher that's supporting them or connected to them. And um, he, just to say, he showed a piece of the Butterfly Circus. Yeah. If you have a minute to go, uh, actually 20 minutes to go watch that online, Google it, the Butterfly Circus. It's what it's all about, empowering our kids with whatever they come to school with to be successful and for the social milieu to empower them as well. Um, there were lots of different topics on school committee organization, engaging stakeholders, updates from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and another um, organization that's just getting its legs called Coaching for Change, building a local diverse teacher pipeline. And so they're figuring out ways to help minorities um, choose to go into teaching and then um, attracting them to suburban and rural schools. So that was really exciting to meet them. Um, the speakers were exciting. I know I don't want to keep going. Um, and at this, I had the responsibility of um, of uh, being a part of the resolution committee. So during this conference, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees and Superintendents proposes resolutions to um, put forth to our legislators. And so there's a list of them, the links in going to be in <coughs> the, um, the minutes. But one of them, for an example, was rejecting the arming of educators. So the, the body took a stand to send forward that we are not in favor of arming our teachers and our educators. Um, talking about accountability standards, um, reproductive health education, gender identity inclusive, athletic participation policies, um, and a bunch of other things. So I thank you very much for this opportunity. I really hope that I'll be able to apply it and share it with other school committee members as we go forward. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We appreciate that Dr. Doxer represented the committee at the uh, conference. Um, I have two, I think, two reports. So one first, um, I would, I'm going to read a statement, but um, this is in regard to the ratification of the collective bargaining agreement. Um, when we went into executive session at the beginning of this meeting, um, we uh, voted to, I, I'm reporting that from that executive session, the Reading School Committee and the town manager, Robert Lala Scher, voted to approve the collective bargaining agreement between the Reading uh, School Committee and the Reading Teachers Association. So the agreement is a three-year contract expiring in August of 2021, and it has the following highlights. A cost of living increase, or a COLA. You will hear people say COLA. 
and that's a capital C O L capital C capital O capital L capital A, not to be confused with any soft drink. So there was a cost of living increase in the first year of two and a half percent, the second year two and a half percent, and the third year two point two five percent. This COLA is in addition to the increase in step and column adjustments for slightly more than half of our teachers. The language changes around meeting time that will support uh, teaching and learning initiatives. There were several lang language changes. There were other language changes which will support our teachers and allow them to do their jobs more effectively. With this agreement, we now have collective bargaining agreements in place with all of our collective bargaining units. By having three-year agreements in place, it allows for budget certainty and stability in our school district. And I want to thank um, I want to thank very much the negotiating teams of each of the bargaining units for their support in reaching these final agreements. I would also like to thank our negotiating team, Mr. Chuck Robinson, Dr. Doherty, Gail Dowd, Jen Bove, Joanne King, Sarah Marchant, for all their hard work since March to um, reach these agreements and achieve this closure. So we are very excited about that. Um, thank you. And I have another item. So on um, November 13th, uh, I attended a select board meeting. Um, Dr. Doxer was also in attendance. Um, one of the highlights of that meeting was that Dr. Anna Ornstein was graciously, and graciously, respectfully, and deservedly acknowledged with a really beautiful proclamation from the select board. Um, there was a, a public discussion at that meeting, um, the specific agenda. The result of the agenda was the um, creation of an ad hoc committee. And there are um, both uh, school committee representatives. So um, as the chair, I uh, will be appointing two school committee representatives. And uh, there's also representation by the school district, so Dr. Doherty will address any school district participation that was uh, initially noted or as it may evolve. And um, so with that in mind, um, I'm actually going to appoint Dr. Doxer and myself um, as the two representatives to the ad hoc committee. Um, it wasn't really a big line, but we're very happy to do it. So definitely. Um, I just also want to highlight just uh, it, it sort of goes along with the, um, the incident that we um, had today. One of the things that Dr. Ornstein highlighted at the end of the meeting after the discussion was this idea of um, courageous conversations. And we've been talking about that in our schools, and uh, I think Principal Hendricks was also referring to that. But what she was really emphasizing, and what some parents at the meeting were emphasizing, was the need to have these courageous conversations in our homes with parents. And we've actually talked about where um, we have to recognize that it's not in enough to just think that, you know, because you think you you are not expressing bias or you're, in fact, you're, you, you uh, embrace diversity, uh, that your kids are getting that. We have to be more explicit than that. And so I think that that's, uh, that was a big takeaway from uh, what Dr. Ornstein said. She was, I think, very empowered and energized at that end of that meeting and, uh, and offered whatever she could do to help us do that so that parents have the capacity to have the courageous conversations. And I think that, you know, that sort of sounds like what the dialogue has been that started on Monday at uh, Birch Middle School. So, um, you know, hopefully we continue to put those resources in place. But. Um, I think that was it. And the other thing is, I am the rep to the HRAC, uh, Human Rights Advisory Committee. They're meeting tonight. The big thing on their plate right now is the Martin Luther King celebration will be on the 21st of January, and they do uh, all the organization and planning. So if anyone's interested in helping uh, plan the Martin Luther King events, um, definitely just get in touch with someone on HRAC. So I think that's it. OK, so that's the. Report, consent agenda reports, and I think we're ready to move on to our new business, which is the late start uh, update, committee update. Mm -hmm. I think we're good.
um, thank you to the committee for our presentation today. I uh, want to introduce members of our committee. I'm actually presenting with one of our co-chairs, or our tri-chairs, if you will, um, the principal of the high school, Kate, Kate Poynton. Uh, but we also have other members. Not all our members of our team are here today, but I just want to uh, go over who was on our team. And if they're here, they can just kind of give us the high five. Our other tri-chair, Linda Williams, is up back. She is actually going to be a note taker for today. So as public comments come out or as school committee have any comments, we're going to take very accurate notes so that when we reconvene at some point, uh, we have a memorialization of anything that is discussed. We also have uh, Elaine Webb on the school committee who attended our committee uh, meetings this year. Uh, we had some staff members, Jess Bailey, who is a teacher at the high school, Sandy Calandrella, who is our after school, uh, before and after school and adult ed director, Sarah Levesque, who is here tonight, um, elementary principal, Tom Zaya, who is here tonight, our uh, assistant principal and athletic director, Lori Hurley. Oh, she came in. She said she was coming. There you are. We had a student uh, from RMHS, Drew Anderson. I don't think Drew's here tonight. And then we had our school resource officers as consult. They started out with our meetings, and they will be uh, reintroduced into the group uh, if approved so that we can look at traffic patterns as it, as it comes up. So a little bit of the history, uh, I know the school committee is probably well versed on this, but just in case uh, you haven't been, um, several years ago, uh, in my capacity in another district, I had heard about this, the Middlesex League superintendents, uh, based on the current research on high school brains and the fact that we're really learning more and more about how high school students, their brain development works, they made a commitment to really looking at adjusting the high school start time, which hadn't been done in, in a very, very long time, and making it later. <clears throat> so at that time, there was a late start working group that um, met in 2016. Um, they actually didn't continue to meet based on some pressing issues in the community like budget overrides and really looking at personnel and staffing, um, and as well as some leadership changes. Kate and I are, are the product of some of those leadership changes. So a, a team was reform this fall. We actually called some of the members, all of the members of the team, and we uh, recommissioned the team. Um, and we met several times this fall, and Kate's going to talk a little bit about what we decided our mission and our goals were. Thanks, Chris. So our mission was to change the schedule. Uh, as many of our peer communities right now, five of the Middlesex League schools have um, sc have changed start times for the high school for their high schools. Um, so many of our peer communities have or will be moving to later start times, and we'll talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. Uh, that uh, there's a commitment amongst all of the Middlesex League's uh, schools to change start times if they have not done so already. So we'll be impacted if we don't, uh, even if we don't change start times, we'll be impacted be other because other schools have. Our goals were to revisit the research on teen sleep patterns to get more up-to-date uh, research as available, and then also to advise on how a later start time uh, for Reading Memorial High School might impact our community. So we conducted surveys of all of the stakeholder groups uh, in order to gather that uh, information. So our agenda tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about what the research is saying, how much teen sleep is really needed, and what the experts are saying. How much sleep are they getting in Reading? Uh, we do have some current um, data on that. What are the proposed changes that we are recommending? I know no vote will be taken tonight. And what consideration and challenges should we continue to plan for? So Kate's going to talk a little bit more about why we're considering this. Talk. So why the high school start time change? Uh, sleep research, and this is back uh, into the early 2000s and even a little bit earlier than that and, and has continued to confirm this, is that teens have a later and different sleep cycle than young children and adults. 
and this is based on biology and their circadian rhythms, not just on lifestyle and technology choices. So much of the research, the older research that we looked at um, was pre-smartphone use. Uh, and so there's been a lot of pushback in, in terms of smartphones. And I would say that this has certainly complicated the issue, but we know that teen sleep cycles um, are different. And we know this from before when smartphones were a widespread, you know, widespread use uh, amongst teens. Uh, so again, a complicating choice, but based on biology and circadian rhythms, teen sleep cycles are much different than adults or young children. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Kate, I think you were going to, yep. So we have a couple of different reports. You have the full text in, in the packet. So the American Pediatric Association talks about the need for teens to have between eight and a half and nine hours of sleep a night. Um, you have that full text that you can read that excerpt. I won't read it verbatim. Next slide. Same thing, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine from 2017, just last year, uh, same thing. Uh, longer narrative that fully explains the need for teens to have this amount of, this amount of sleep uh, at night. And then our other current research supporting later starts, there's a list there from the American Medi Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, the MIAA, um, the NEA, National Sleep Foundation, and Society of Behavior Medicine. And there are hyperlinks to each and every one of these resources in, your, um, in, the, in the packets um, and then on um, digitally um, online. And we're setting up a website, uh, and it's already actually set up, just not populated yet, uh, with any information on let, Late Start, including this presentation with the hyper, where anybody in the community wants to look through some of they don't have to hunt and peck for it, we've, we've added it all there for them. So what is the biology around sleep teen patterns? This is a small sketch of the brain. I'm not going to go through all the scientific words here, but um, this, we talked about circadian rhythms, and that's that daily pacemaker. That's the part of the brain that includes sleep-wake patterns. They, it also con controls things like temperature, <laughs> hormones, metabolism, all of that. Um, and there's actually brain research that shows that that particular SCN, they call it, um, controls the brain. It looks different in teens than it looks in adults, and it looks different than in children. And that's part of why the circadian sleep patterns look different for, for children, especially in the ages of 14 to 18. And their natural sleep pattern, uh, based on the research, is from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. So going to bed earlier and limiting screen time, which we are total fans of, um, and screen time actually limits melatonin production, which is our natural um, developed enzyme, the, the hormone that helps us sleep. That absolutely limits it when you're using screen time, especially at night. Um, that can help with sleep patterns, but in the end, it's actually the physiological difference of a teen brain that makes them go to bed late and feel really drowsy in the morning. And not all kids feel that way, but the research is that most do. Mm -hmm. And here's uh, something in your slide that actually shows the difference of the sleep patterns. The darker shade are children's sleep patterns. And then you can see as they move into adolescent, the good news is for us adults, it moves back. Um, and you can tell that we get really tired later um, and usually are peppier in the morning, at least I am. Um, and here's another graphic. This is all in the packet and will be on the website from the CDC. And it talks about that kids in, and nationwide aren't getting enough sleep. They just aren't. And that adolescents are at risk if they don't get enough sleep. Uh, oops. Oops. Sorry. One slide over. We so are. we looked at our YRBS, the youth, youth Risk and Behavior Surveys, from back in 2015 and 2017. So what this uh, slide shows is how much sleep uh, our teens are getting, um, five hours or less, six hours, seven hours, eight hours. And we're seeing that our teens are not getting enough sleep. So in this slide, and there was a drop um, from 24 to 22% uh, of our teens, this is our high school students, report getting eight or, eight or more hours of sleep at night. Um, so a, a drop from 2015 to 2016 uh, from our own uh, data from 2015 and 2017 Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And then, so 24% of Reading High School students got eight hours, 
eight plus hours of sleep compared to 66% of middle schoolers. So that last um, sort of comparison bar graph, the purple to the light blue, 66% of our middle schoolers report getting eight, more than eight hours of sleep, whereas only 24% of our high schoolers report getting that much sleep. And remember that it's eight and a half to nine and a half hours that are um, optimal amount of sleep um, for our teens to get. Um, and that again is combined from the 2015 and 2017 YRBS. And then Reading High School students on this slide report slightly higher rates of eight, uh, eight plus hours of sleep compared to the state rate, but only 15% of seniors. So this to me was pretty striking. That far right graph, only 15% of our seniors report getting um, enough sleep, more than eight hours of sleep. And you can see a steady decline from freshmen with the light blue, sophomore year gray, orange, red, which is our juniors, and then our seniors are getting not enough sleep, um, you know, near, not nearly enough sleep um, that they need. And the CDC and the American um, Academy of Pediatrics, and I know we have a local pediatrician here that hopefully will speak during our uh common or open session, they, there's some real adverse effects with sleep deprivation. Um, that's actually how they, they use it. They talk about teens not getting enough sleep as being sleep deprived. We use that as a term kind of, oh, I'm sleep deprived. It's a casual term, but it actually does have health, social, emotional, and risk effects. So one of the adverse effects, of course, is increased anxiety. When you're tired, you're more anxious. Um, there is an increased level of depression and vulnerability to stress with teens that are tired um, and, and adults that are tired too. Uh, decreased motivation, um, we know that when you're tired you're not as, as uh, peppy and ready to go. Uh, increased obesity rates, so these are uh, risks, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a Reading issue, although statistically, nationally, we have to look at all of that, that teens that are tired and, and really sleep deprived are at risk for these health risks. And then other health re related, it certainly exacerbates any other medical conditions that folks may have. We also have safety risks that are based on current research, such as drowsy driving, I didn't include statistics on that, but it's pretty um, harrowing when you start looking at um, teenage accident rates um, and sleep when they're questioned about when they slept last, how long they slept, uh, it's very alarming. Impulse control, which uh, certainly goes into risky behaviors, and the next one is increased risk behaviors. Um, we're also looking at performance rates, that students that are tired don't always perform as high as they should. They have lower academic achievement, they sometimes have impairments with executive functioning, that's that whole planning and getting things done, that internal voice that tells us how to uh, really break apart complex problems and get it done. And working memory, that's when we have our short term memory and we want to put it into our medium or long term memory, uh, that students that are tired have a really hard time with that. Uh, decreased creativity, we know we have great creative minds in Reading. Um, when you're tired, you're not as creative. Uh, attendance and tardiness, again, based on national standards, and certainly we're constantly looking at our attendance rates and our tardy uh, rates as well. This last bullet to me um, was surprising, that student athletes that do not get at least eight hours of sleep are actually 2.3 times more at risk for sports-related injuries. Now, maybe that's because of those executive functioning or not impulse control, but it also could be that the body is just tired and more weak, um, but they are really at risk for more injuries, that some of which could be really career changing. So then um, looking through many of the stakeholders' comments, some folks said, well, shouldn't they just go to bed earlier? And the answer is no. Um, and maybe yes, no in the sense that if your circadian rhythm is having you go to bed late, even if you go to bed early, you're not going to fall asleep. Now not all kids fall into that, but most do and this is based on science. Um, the circadian rhythms of the sleep patterns really give a lot of kids extra burst. A lot of high school parents I talk to and I've known wrestle with that. You tell them to go to bed, they're dilly-dallying, who knows what, doing what, we're not sure. 
it's now 11 o'clock and everyone's still up in the house. And frankly, as an adult, we're tired. Um, many teens even forced, if forced to go to bed early, find it really hard to go to sleep before 11. And that melatonin, which is that natural hormone, that natural enzyme that keeps them sleeping, hopefully full sleep, um, it doesn't really dissipate from their system until approximately 8 a.m. 8 8 so when they have classes or they're up earlier than that, they're really very, very sleepy. And we certainly have heard that. So what will, will they go to bed later if we change the times? And that came up in our surveys a lot. Well, researchers have found that high school students that have had um, different changes in their schedule, they actually don't add on another hour. So it wasn't like, okay, now I can sleep another hour, I'm gonna stay up till midnight. That, um, that could happen and, and every kid is different, every child is different, but the researchers have found that because this really is a physiological condition, that typically kids have that natural cycle and especially with the supportive families we have in Reading that will work on that and hopefully that 11 to 7 a.m. Uh, sleep time can really be uh, fostered with a later start. So we, we not only looked at the Middlesex League, and Chris will talk a little bit more about that um, in terms of what they're finding, uh, where most school, the schools that changed in the Middlesex League changed for this year. We looked nationwide, and Wilton, Connecticut, they changed their start time in 2003, and they found that students um, report sleeping that extra hour. And so the quote there is from 2009. They looked back, um, you know, fully six years after they had made the change. Um, they found that no one is even looking back. Our students are happier performing at high levels academically sports teams continue to be among the best in the state they found really no adverse effects and that was back in 2009 they have continued with that late start um, today so Wilton Connecticut has that late start and are finding no no ill effects so this is just one snapshot of one school um, that um, has made the change the change is now you know well over 10 years gone and um, they, they're not looking back at all they've seen positive effects so as Kate mentioned earlier, uh, we're in the Middlesex League, which uh, we're one of 12 districts, and right now five of them have already made the change to late start. Um, they're listed right there, Burlington, Melrose, Stoneham, Watertown, Winchester, um, and the other communities are in the process of this planning. Some are planning it for next year or discussing planning it for next year. Some are working on next year and the following year uh, planning for that. Um, the league is already starting to schedule sports events for next year, and even this year, because we have five districts that are, are ending, some of them af well after three o'clock, it has already impacted our sports schedule. So the athletic directors have actually already started drafting um, fall schedules based on the fact that more than half of the districts, or half of the districts, uh, could be really changing uh, their, st their end times. And some of the other districts outside the Middlesex uh, League are, and some of these you might have heard of, Acton, Boxborough. These are all recent changes to their start to their start and end time at a later time. Acton, Boxborough, Ashland, Concord, Carlisle, Duxbury, East Ham, Hingham, Holyoke, Marblehead, Marlboro, Monomy, Needham, Nosset, Sharon, Weston, and Grant Grant Dunstables in the process. So there are a lot of districts um, making this change, looking typically at high school and some of you might say well what about others some of the districts have made a universal change primarily because of busing if they're a heavily bus district it really does involve a complete change from elementary to middle school to high school and we'll talk about what we're proposing so um, as part of our surveying, I, uh, Tom Zay and I surveyed some high school principals, some superintendents, and some athletic directors. Um, and those who have yet to make the change are in the process, just like we are. They're investigating it. They're looking at how that's going to impact them. Transportation is a big issue for buses, uh, heavily bus districts. But some reported less students who were tardy and better overall attendance, the ones that made the change already. Some reported increased participation in breakfast at campus. Uh, high school breakfasts are not usually well attended. Um, that's been kind of a, a nice benefit is that more kids come to school and eat breakfast and, and socialize at that time. 
and some reported opportunities for a slower pace in the morning, including student support time at 8 a.m. rather than 7 a.m. So making up a quiz, asking for extra help, uh, the 8 a.m. time definitely lets kids kind of get here and do that in ways that they hadn't really expected. So current RMHS start time is 7.30 and our end time is 2.11. We have a proposed new start time for 8.30 and a proposed new end time at 3.02. And we reviewed our high school schedule, that's with the ad addition back in of uh, office hours, and we l took a look and proposed to have the same length um, for each period of the day, with the exception of first period, we shaved off uh, a couple minutes on first period and a minute or two here and there to get us to the 302. A couple extra minutes that first period for announcements. One thing we were very committed to doing was to not impact passing time. It's at four minutes and we cannot feasibly, given the size of the building and the crowding in the hallways, shave off any time in, in passing time. Um, so that is maintained at the four minutes. Uh, and we also felt very strongly to not be the latest district, not be the latest school in the district. So we worked kind of creatively, uh, and I have Chris to thank for this, to be able to, to do the, the audit on time on learning, the full audit, um, that allowed us to shave a few minutes off to give us that 302 dismissal time. So that is our, that is our proposal. Thank you. We took into consideration the considerations and challenges with moving to a later start time for staff, and we really want to, if, if the school committee approves this, uh, want to work with staff to help mitigate uh, impact. And so we looked to assess and support the impact on staff and their families, schedules and commutes. Uh, we looked at the impact on traffic and the ability to lead clubs and student support. Here's a graph of what our staff, and it's pretty well evenly split if you take a look. Uh, the traffic and commute, childcare, extracurriculars, and then others. Um, some shared benefits such as students sleeping later and being less sleepy. Um, so some staff members were in support of this. Several also mentioned benefits such as last minute lesson planning and feeling less rushed as a teacher. Um, and there were people who had wide ranges of opinions on the start time from pros and, and cons. Um, but the concerns were, were evenly split. Some of the considerations to support staff include committing to have staff meetings before school so that we're not keeping people um, much later uh, at the end of the day. Um, consideration for other movement of meetings to become before school offerings. Opportunities for student support times before school but not before eight o'clock. Formation of a scheduling committee to consider other changes of schedules during the day, potentially for the school year of 2020 to 21. I think this does offer us an opportunity to take a look globally at our schedule to see if it's meeting our, our, our students' needs. Uh, it has not been changed, I think, in over 10 years. Uh, the schedule, I think, was changed maybe in 2006, 2007. Uh, so for me, it's an opportunity to, to take a look uh, at the schedule. Are we meeting our students' needs? Um, and should, should we make some tweaks to sort of globally the schedule? Not for next year. That's a more long-term process. Um, but for potentially 2021 or 21, 22. So as we looked at our mission to really look at uh, assessing the needs of the families, the students, and the community at large, if we were to make a move to a later start time, um, some of the things that we considered were assessing um, of any change, and especially in our, the impact of traffic on our local community, maintaining community access to shared fields, especially lit fields, and I know uh, that came up in the surveys quite a bit, transportation, and then continuing to to review impact on the overall community and organizations. So this is part of the work that we have been doing and will continue to do if we move forward with this. 
So, oops, sorry, we had uh, 1,500 respondents um, to the survey, uh, about 473 students and about 1,000 parents, a few community members, which was a huge response. Um, we, we left it open for two and a half weeks and we did get a huge response. Um, some of the community members uh, are saying some of the benefits are increased sleep. Some aren't sure or not, don't think that they may be. We have ha happy and healthy teens, learning enhanced, less rushed, tardy, and then we had a whole lot of others, one or two of this and one or two of that. Some of the concerns that were shared, a lot of them have to do with sports participation and if will this impact sports participation, um, especially with shared fields. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the things that we're, we're discussing in preparing for this, if, if this is the way we're going. Uh, traffic around town, a lot of people talked about that. Club participation, child care, um, that came up as, as a, a smaller issue, but maybe an issue. After school employment of teens, um, you know, having to go to work a little later. Um, and then obviously transportation is always a consideration. So what are some of the specific concerns? Um, basically it came down to sports, traffic, extracurricular, employment, all of that, child care, transportation, kind of what we expected. What I can tell you is we only had 117 people that actually shared these concerns. So out of the 1,500, only 117 shared these specific concerns. So what are we proposing to consider as we move forward, if we move forward, is that we would open our library and our cafeteria before school um, with breakfast in the cafeteria and hopefully, like other districts, see an increase of breakfast um, and, and time around that. Uh, we currently keep the library open in the afternoon. Some of that time or maybe all of that time might be shifted to the morning. That's part of what we'll look at is how, how heavily would it be used um, so that students who can meet and want to come to school early their circadian rhythms look different and they're ready to start their homework uh, in the morning or continue their homework in the morning, it'll be available for them. Uh, we are also talking about forming a homework committee um, to discuss homework policy. One of the things as we reviewed the 1500 surveys and, and I read through every single one that came up absolutely over and over and over again was parents concerned about the amount of homework that we have in, in the high school and that kids are really exhausted from that they're up way too late finishing homework so we need to really have a committee to talk about what does that look like not to you know say no homework but really let's look at what homework looks like and let's look at what reasonable homework expectations are um, the RMHS leadership and that includes uh, Tom Zaya and his team as well as Kate and I and anyone else at the high school we're gonna work with coaches and advisors on scheduling and really look at hard end times um, you know, again, we're all about the success of writing. We love the fact that we are such a successful district. Sports, arts, all of it. We, we hear it every day and we're so proud of them. But sometimes we, some of these practices, some of these play um, practices, all of it, it goes really, really late. And we're going to look at that and say, you know, again, we want our kids to be home in bed and feeling good about the next day ahead of them. And that doesn't mean that we don't value the time at any of these sports or arts uh, participation, but we really have to look at that. Opportunities for student support uh, before school. A lot of times teachers have office hours after school. Um, we want to be sensitive to the fact that with the later end time, our staff may be leaving right right as school ends um, and really publicizing that, that they, they may be available um, based on their own needs uh, with student support time before school. As Kate mentioned, uh, putting together a scheduling committee that will also include student voice on that um, around what kind of scheduling changes changes might we want to consider. Working with the SRO, um, our school resource officers, and our police department about what traffic might look like. Um, we definitely heard from other districts that they're still working on traffic patterns. We've already started that conversation, and if approved, we'll continue it. And then um, working with recreation, facilities, and other outside agencies to help with field and building schedules. And I can tell you, Tom Zaya and I have already started having conversations with the recreation, the Y, and other outside agencies about what that would look like. Now, obviously, we only have an, a limited amount of buildings and facilities and fields, but we're going to do the best we can um, and, and really try to be very equitable around that. So um, these are the considerations that we have. Thank you.
So this is our, uh, that's the last slide. This is our report. And we're open for questions or comments from the yep. school committee. I'll take um, questions from the committee first. Thank you. And um, I don't know, we might need to have Lynn and Tom come forward. Okay. Mr. Bobby. Yeah. Great presentation. You answered my first question coming into tonight, which was, if we extend by an hour, will people actually sleep? Mm -hmm. and it sounds like they do from the research. It's the best you can do. I thought that was very well presented. I have a safety concern mm -hmm. that comes from having stood outside of the high school in an election year, mm -hmm. holding a sign in the cold at 7.30 in the morning. And what I've observed when I did that, and this is a few years ago, is that there are very defined waves of traffic in front of Birch Meadow, and then in front of Coolidge, and then in front of the high school under the current, well, it's, I'm sorry, now it's the high school first, right. then Birch Meadow, then mm -hmm. Coolidge. And it's about a 10 minute window for each school, mm -hmm. about 15 minutes before that first bell. And it's remarkably efficient for the number of cars that come and go. And if parents who have been in that line know that the rules, right, they're very well enforced and, and people kind of know how to order their day around that. There are a lot of cars that go in and out of the high school. Mm -hmm. A lot of those are driven by students. Mm -hmm. And so I think having the Reading Police Department guide how we roll this out, if we roll this out, is going to be critical because you've got a few things colliding here. So if we put this at 8.30, you're looking at it instead of a 7.15 to 7.25 wave at the high school where it's just, mm -hmm. it's an, just a continuous line of cars coming off of um, Main Street Route 28 onto Oakland Road. Oakland Road is, Road is nice and wide. I have seen people try to go around that line of cars through where the parking spaces are and drive where they're not supposed to and go racing by at well in excess of 20 miles an hour. And I've seen that repeatedly. People late to drop off at Coolidge, people trying to cut through, doing who knows what. There's always going to be people stressed and late, right? And so when you mix the teenage driving brain with the adult I'm late to work brain and the kids, the other thing is that parents will drop off for Coolidge sometimes on the high school side of that road, on, on Oakland Road. And so you have kids, young kids, darting across the road and you don't see them to now there's a crossing guard. Everybody uses the crossing guard. And so I'm, I'm going on a little bit because I, I am really concerned about the safety of everybody involved. So. Aside from this, th there's a significant non-trivial component of how do we route traffic, how do we have a heavy police presence, particularly in the beginning so people know that the rules will be enforced and we're really serious about safety and you know, you're know, going to get caught if you cheat, right? That's the kind of culture we need to roll out with this. So I just, I, I appreciate that last point, that, or the second to last one where you were working with the police department. I, I just want to say that's really important to me. Thank you. And, and just as a, as a comment, that's why the SROs are part of our committee. Um, they came to our first meeting and we talked about some of the concerns we had around traffic and safety. Um, if approved, they're going to now be part of our planning team and we're going to go from there that they already generated, they already generated a bunch of ideas mm -hmm. along those lines there's there's an opportunity at this site to um, rectify and really create some patterns that could that would do that and I think Possibly. the SROs definitely are aware of that and indicated that and there's there's some you know information available so I think it's excellent Ms. Robinson did, and I don't know why I saw Tom way in the back. Have we gotten any, do we have any feedback on how it, how the other towns that are doing it already affected Reading this year? Uh, our, our athletics? Tom, do you want to come up to a mic? Yeah. You de definitely need to. Game start time. It doesn't have to be you, I just know that. It, it should be Tom. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Uh, in, the, in the league, this is the first year that we've had the later starts. So we've pushed our game schedules back by about a half hour, 40 minutes. Um, the times that schools are getting out, Watertown right now is the latest. Uh, they were getting to us at about 4.30 for a 4 o'clock game. Um, so it, it depends a little bit on that. But we're sort of looking at this year as athletic directors as how is this going to work, and then we're going to reconvene and see what we're going to plan for next year. Mm -hmm. So even right now, Reading's not a late start. We're still being affected by the other five communities. Okay. Um, so I'm raising my hand for myself. Uh, so 
What was the, uh, what's the range of the um, end times of those five districts? Yeah, I, I left that paper over. Okay, there. just because you're saying they, they get here at 4.30, but you know, is there? Is I think, there... I believe Watertown might be the latest, Watertown's the latest. 309. There, uh, Winchester's 307, no, uh, Watertown is 305, actually. Winchester is 307. And I think there's one, Burlington's 305. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and I think all the, the data leading up to the, the decision all, is all good and all makes sense. And then if we do make this decision, I just, we're gonna make sure we think about all the things it's impacting and you know, I think the, uh, you know, we have a lot of information and uh, about what, how it's going to impact the Middlesex League issues. And uh, I think it's important that we also iron out uh, what, what's, how's that ripple effect on, on the youth uh, that are, and you, you mm -hmm. said it, we don't have enough, you know. So I what think that, you know, we just got to have, uh, Creative, uh, and I, I can think of some ways that we can use other venues that we're not using after dark now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, you know, especially you know in the early spring when you're dealing with uh, uh, you know like lacrosse and stuff, and then in the later fall with mm -hmm. Pop Warner and stuff, because all those uh, organizations. Uh, pay for the fields. They're all taxpayers, and, and we just need to be mindful of, of that we have a solution to offer them. Might not be, per, but something so that they can continue to uh, do the good things they do for kids in this community. Right. Yeah. We and we agree with that totally. We myself, I talk with the recreation director daily even right now about trying to find equitable ways. If we give up a day, can we steal some time here or you borrow time there? And I think there's gonna be even more of that that we'll, that we'll do, looking at different days um, and yeah, extend it some hours maybe. Uh, one of the things that came up in our meeting uh, with the recreation director is that some of those outside agencies are actually waiting now because if Tom is uh, has this reserved a game for four and we're waiting for a bus to get here, that you know that has now had a, a trickle down effect. Um, so the good news is that if we schedule accordingly based on a, a little bit later of, a, of an end time, that you know people won't be waiting around. I think that's a frustration too. Is if you come for an outside agency and you think you're starting at X time and you're waiting around because the high school hasn't finished yet. Um, but we're going to be working with Jenna and with um, the rec department and any of the other, other outside we've we've offered to, to talk to you them as well. I mean, Watertown, I think that that's 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 a place that either coming or going to is the very traffic. congested yeah. with traffic. And I can see a bus sitting on 128 or where, however way yeah. they get here. And why is it that when you get together as as athletic directors or superintendents, or why does everyone have a different? Why don't we all pick the same time? <laughs> uh, like if we're at three, why isn't it? Why are some at three oh seven and some at start or end start or end time or our game times? No end time start oh, end yeah, time. So uh, I mean, I, I don't know. Do you want Wouldn't some of it has to? People? So some of it has to do with their transportation schedules yeah. because they have tiered buses. Right. Um, they have to do it that way. Some of it has to do with time and learning schedules. Um, as Kate mentioned, we went through every single day of the year and made sure that we are more than satisfying our requirements for the state. So some districts have different things. They have different passing times. They have shorter passing times. They have more passing times. Some districts have um, block scheduling or flex time that doesn't count for time on learning, different things. So each district has little different nuances. We worried about our schedule and, and made sure that we're meeting our requirements, but that's part of why they all look a little bit different. Okay. And I just have one other thing to add. Yeah, Mr. Robinson. A bunch of things, but I'll just one other. Uh, just to uh, Mr. Boavin's point, and I get, what is the, so right now the high school will be, uh, starting or starting at 8 30 now mm -hmm. when does coolidge actually start is that start around i don't have that coolidge is 750 coolidge is 750 okay so 750. 
So that then there is a, there is still a yeah. a lag between, uh, but Birch Metal will be starting at eight fifteen, eight twenty five. Okay. <clears throat> So we're adding, we're combining kind of the, all of that traffic together, but Coolidge is still a little bit. Yeah, it'll be yeah, Coolidge isn't. Yeah, Coolidge isn't changing. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. I just had one thing I, I wanted to add in the um, on the end times. I think that this is something that we you know we do need to work on in terms of. You know, obviously, when st when students are at some sort of competitive event and they're uh, whether it's here or away, the competitions are, are you know if it's, it's wrestling, if every match goes into overtime, it's a long a long competition, and so you know you're you're at home. When are my kids getting home? Uh, you know to sort of get that finish up on your homework and sort of stay unplugged and get to bed. Um, so I think that the work there is work that needs to be done across the board. So I appreciate that that's um, you know that's going to be part of the dialogue. Um, and I also just want to say the um, in terms of I think uh, Kate you raised the issue or Chris did that you know this this uh, issue is not um, just because of smartphones, but I think it is worthy to note some of the data that the um, the type of screen time that you're having in the evening dip can influence you, um, whether it's sort of passive or interactive. And I know I would often get into an argument with my kids because I'm telling them, no, you know, no computers in your bedroom, no phones. Uh, we held off the video. I was the mean mom, but um, they would say, well, you're watching TV. You know, but there is a difference between the passive and the interactive, and I think overall, um, anyway, we're all going to be, uh, as we go forward, reading about some of the, the more recent data that sort of it seems to be charging out of Silicon Valley lately, but, yeah. um, you know, on what's the right thing to do. So that's part of it, but it wasn't, it was the issue around, you know, what's the sleep and the circadian rhythms has been there before the screens. So I appreciate um, you kind of clarifying that. I'm going to do Dr. Doxer and then go back to um, Dr. Doxer. I wanted to say thank you so much for this inclusive. I was really hoping for all the research to be integrated, and you did just that. I really appreciate that. And I also appreciated a lot of the letters that we got with provocative questions yeah. and other points of view. I think I really appreciate when we hear from people um, with their questions as well. One of the things that came crystal clear through is, is something you've mentioned, that it's not just about changing the start and end times. It's also about the education that goes along with it. You know, the kids are anxious. Kids are using energy drinks to stay awake. That's a drug to me. Mm -hmm. um, the coffees at the middle, at the beginning of the day, recognizing those things, but also recognizing the power of the cell phones at the end of the day. I, if my husband's watching, I admit it. I'm bad. I have to shut it off. I don't do it well. Um, but th there are ways that we can work with one another and with the parents to empower ourselves to shut those addictions down um, and, and to find those apps that will help us. I know that I have found an app on my computer that tells me you are going to have to wake up in six hours. You are going, and, <laughs> and it changes the light on my device mm -hmm. that helps me so that I've found I can fall asleep faster. Um, but those are kinds of things that can be resourced through us when we're trying to make this successful change. And I really appreciate that you reached out both to the families, to the families and to the staff, and also to our neighbors, the other communities that are doing this. I don't think we have to remake the wheel in terms of taking two years that some other community has done. I think that if we've done our research, and we talk to everybody's concerns that that we can make an educated decision for our students because they're really central to this. Um, I like that the idea of respecting the teacher's day so that they might be able to have their meetings beforehand when they're used to being here anyways. Um, and also setting that rule, guideline, policy, I'm not sure which it would be about not not um, putting student meetings before school because that window now exists, whether it's for student support or whether it's for early practices. I used to practice soccer at 6.30 in the morning 
that wouldn't help our late start anymore. Um, and, and sometimes an opening just sucks people in. So having a policy or a guideline like that, I really like that idea. Um, so thank you for this research. And I know that even when we take this vote, the process is not over. Right. right. Thank you. Ms. Bobbin. Yeah, so next set of questions are around compliance. And as you've done in the past, you answered my first question, which was just confirming that we're getting the state required number of minutes on in every category that's applicable. So yeah. time on learning, number of minutes and in instruction in a yeah. year and, and a day and so forth. So assuming that's been done, one thing we haven't talked about and none of the slides have addressed are making sure that we're still able to meet our obligations for special ed students, in particular to the extent we have out of district placements with transportation schedules. We also, apart from special ed, have a MECA program that involves transportation and busing. Can you speak to meet the, what you've done to make sure we're meeting the obligations that we already have for those students? So as far as uh, students who are in district, if we make this change, that change will be made. We'll work with any of the transportation organizations um, you know, North Reading, transportation, any of, of the services that we currently employ, we will work with them. That'll be part of the planning process. Um, Jason Cross and I, we meet very regularly. Uh, we actually met yesterday again uh, to talk about how this will impact. Um, currently, there are two Medco buses. We may have to reshuffle that deck a little bit. Right now, he has uh, K to 6 on one bus and 7 to 12 on another. Um, right now, the high school bus typically picks them up at 255 to 305 or so so this isn't a huge change um, he's actually excited about the morning for the Medco high school kids um, one of the things that we are tracking and we are concerned is that if you are not a resident of Reading and you miss the bus quite often that means a no school day mm -hmm. so if you're one minute late for the bus and they're gone you're now out of a day so he is excited to see if this would help us with that because that is something that we're working really closely on Chad tracking that data and working with families. So I, I see this as a plus. More able, yeah. more able to get to the bus on time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and um, Jason Cross is our MEDCO director. Mm -hmm. I'm just, just to follow up to that. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, Jason Cross is our MEDCO coordinator. Sorry, sure. director. So I, and my, my point in asking that isn't, isn't that you wouldn't do that. It's, it's that, look, these buses don't sit around all day and do nothing. No. They have other routes. And so Correct. I just don't want, I want to make sure that we're not in a situation where we're making assumption we haven't tested as, yep. as a group saying, oh, well, the bus that we usually get hypothetically that at seven is going to be available at eight. It may not be. You know, just right. going to make sure. And, and if, if it is available at eight, is the cost structure the same or does it cost more? I don't know. So just make, make sure that we're able to keep all the commitments we've made to The Metco. cost would be the same. Um, as far as the schedule goes, if we have middle school and high schools on the same bus, they would come at the middle school start time. So that would give them student support time. Okay. Um, and Jason and I already started talking about what could that look like. Okay. Um, it, it's exciting to think of the possibilities. Right now, it goes on the high school start time. So so again, the middle schoolers that ride that bus have to be on that bus really early. Right. So this is going to this is going to change that kind of conundrum that we're in right now with a very very early pickup time. No, I think I think it has a lot of potential yeah. to to improve the yeah. circumstances for everyone. But thank you for asking the question. And, and and on the special ed side, do we have your your commitment that this is not going to in any way you know, impact our ability to meet the needs of anybody on an IEP or any of our? We absolutely students? are always committed to that. Okay. Are there any other committee members? Not a lot. We've have, had some uh, community members who signed up to speak. Um, We're going to um, go over there and yeah. we can answer questions from there. I just want to give folks the podium so that they have it. Autumn Thank Hendrickson you, and David Quarry had signed up, so I would take those folks first in order. And then uh, if there's other people here, just raise your hand. I. Um, Alicia. Yeah, we'll try to just be cognizant that there's a bunch of people here who want to speak and we try to have the comments take uh, just a couple of minutes. Thank you. Autumn. All right. Thank you. Um, my name is Autumn Hendrickson, and I am currently a junior at RMHS. Um, as an active member of the student body at RMHS, uh, the proposal that would change school hours at my high school from 7.30 a.m. to 2.11 p.m. to 8.30 a.m. to 3.02 p.m. deeply concerns me. And as you can probably imagine, 
that is what I'm here to talk about. Uh, I want to start my remarks by saying this. Uh, I am very familiar with the research that is being used to back up this proposal. People who know me know that I am a complete nerd. So this type of research is no stranger to me. Uh, I am aware of how many neighboring communities have done this, but it would be a logical fallacy to say that because neighboring communities have changed their school start times, we should too. Every community is different. Um, I am also aware of the benefits of having more sleep and later start times for schools by proxy, uh, but I hope that the argument I am about to present might help you to understand how the later start times will probably not achieve the goal you are hoping for. Uh, the reality that we are going to be looking at now is simply having all of our schedules pushed back by one hour, which is something that I found was a consensus among everyone that I spoke to for the most part. Uh, the only thing that, we, that we'll be changing is the time at which we are doing things. Teachers will continue to assign the same amount of work. Practices and extracurricular activities will be the same length, and we will be going to bed and getting up one hour later. We will, in essence, get the exact same amount of sleep. In order to prepare for this speech, I went around asking my classmates three questions. Uh, how much homework did they have a night, hours and hours? Um, what time did they go to bed? And what kind of extracurriculars did they participate in? The results I got were not surprising, but it did surprise me how shocked adults were when I recited these numbers to them. The average amount of homework each night came out to roughly four hours, with the lowest amount being one freshman who said 30 minutes, and the highest being two juniors saying eight hours. Let that sink in for a second. Eight hours, eight. I initially thought they were joking. Don't believe me? What I learned over the course of the survey day made it clear to me that it wasn't out of the realm of possibility, since their homework was staggered by both of their extracurriculars. Mm. Marching band and color guard practices run from 5.45 p.m. to 9 p.m. Most sports practice for at least two hours after school. Many students also said they worked jobs. Most extra extracurriculars lasted roughly one hour. Uh, and drama rehearsals run from 2.45 p.m. to 5 p.m. on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Thursdays. This is absolutely insane. Any high school-aged kid has every reason in the world to not be able to sleep at night. We have so many other things going on that by the time 11 o'clock rolls around, we're praying that we finished our homework. What we really need to be talking about here is how stress impacts students. For God's sake, half the reason why we can't sleep is due to stress, mm -hmm. which has been proven by many studies to significantly hinders one, hinder one's ability to sleep. Teenagers today are expected to not just complete the class, their class and homework, but to do so with care and thought, attend at least one extracurricular activity, participate in their chosen sports practices and games, be a role model for younger children, be an active member of their community, get enough exercise every day, take care of their mental health, maintain and create close friendships with others, forge relationships with, or at the very least, respect their teachers and mentors, love and care for their family members, successfully avoid getting involved with the wrong people, resist peer pressure, figure out who they love, learn to love themselves, get the proper amount of sleep each night, balance their crazy schedules, and somehow find time to be a kid, to relax. So you might be inclined to say at this point, well, this should relieve stress. Lack of sleep is a really big stressor for our students. Well, according to the Reading Public Schools 2017 student survey, a measly 6% of our RMHS students cited lack of sleep as their primary negative stressor. The largest percentage belonged to none other than schoolwork at 36%, followed by being too busy at 24%, worrying about their future at 10%, school expectations at 10%, and family or personal situations at 9%. Enrollment data for Reading Memorial High School provided by the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education says that during the 2017-18 school year, there were 1,235 students at RMHS. 
So using that information, I can tell you that 444 of your RMHS students cited schoolwork as causing them the most stress, and just under 300 cited being too busy as their primary stressor, while 74 of your RMHS students cited that lack of sleep was their main source of stress. The truth is that stress and sleep go hand in hand, which is backed up by findings from the American Psychological Association, or APA, which I will sum up by saying this. According to the APA, if you are stressed, you don't sleep, and if you don't sleep, you're more stressed. And making such a drastic change within our community in the name of sleep, along with a pact signed by neighboring communities, will do absolutely nothing if you do not also address the stress that your students are under. Because it's not going to go away just because we start school at 8.30, end at 3.02, and maybe get an extra hour of sleep. A pact signed by Middlesex League superintendents to implement this change should not take precedence over the needs of this community. Lastly, I do quickly want to address the faculty side of this issue because I think it's incredibly important. These teachers, as I said during the campaign for the override last year, are what make Reading, Reading. The reason why this community is still known for its schools is because through all the struggles, both financial and social, our teachers have stepped up to the plate at a great personal cost to care for their kids, their students. Just because these people work for the school district does not mean they are disposable. Of course, you will find someone to hire when teachers leave the Reading Public Schools because of this schedule change. But when you choose to treat these teachers as, well, as what they are, essentially employees, you are choosing some brand new teacher over, over a teacher who has dedicated their heart and soul to this community. The many fires that burn within our teachers' hearts, that burn solely for this community and this job, will be forced to leave because even though they cared for their community, their community did not seem to care for them. As I finish up here, I do want to share that I made sure to discuss what people believed could actually make this work when I, when I brought this up. And just one last comment to everyone here. Anyways, when I broached the subject of the late start with my peers, as well as some teachers, everyone seemed to agree on two main things. The absolutely insane amount of schoolwork and extracurricular hours needs to be addressed along with, not separately, the concept of a late start. And that an 8 a.m. to 8.20 a.m. start would be much more helpful and much more doable. Finally, I want to make it abundantly clear that I am in no way personally against Dr. Doherty, Ms. Kelly, or anyone on the school committee. As I have said before, I love this town, and the reason why I am speaking here tonight with such passion and intensity is because this is something that I, as well as many of my peers, whom most, if not all, could not attend because they are currently doing homework. Can Thank you. Uh, David Corey. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Corey. I'm a Reading resident. I also happen to be uh, married to a school teacher here at the high school, uh, so I get that perspective at home as well. I came tonight to speak in support of the change to the school start time. I've been paying attention to the research around school start times for about 15 years. Um, I've been wondering for about a decade why, when is Reading going to do something about this? Um, and I, there's something that I saw on the way in um, to this building this evening. It's on the wall right across from the main office. And one of the lines on the item that's up on the wall, it says, science is real. <laughs> And I think the science is real is something that we need to pay attention to. There's a lot of things that are logistical considerations that are all very real, absolutely. And I want to applaud the committee for identifying all of those issues and taking steps to address them. Um, but those are things that I think we need to build around the basic facts that are not changeable which is the science around circadian rhythms in the teen population. And um, the science and research in other schools and whatnot, which you pointed out, shows that kids do get an extra hour of sleep. I applaud you for considering some of the things that, that were just brought up around um, 
practice times, um, a, a homework committee to look at the amount of homework, because um, I agree with a lot of your statements there. Um, so I, I applaud you for looking at it systemically. Um, but I do think that, that the fundamental unchangeable piece here is the science around teen sleep schedules, circadian rhythms. And I think we need to listen to that and then arrange the other parts of our educational ecosystem to, um, to reflect and honor that. So I, I want to encourage the school committee to adopt this change uh, because I think it's really positive for the students, which should be what we're about. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to say from a teacher standpoint, because I, I happen to actually talk to my wife, um, <laughs> and she talks to other teachers, as you can imagine, um, th you know, there are mixed opinions. Um, she is in favor of this as well. Um, and there are a lot of teachers that are in favor of it as well uh, for a lot of the, the same reasons that you pointed out in terms of kind of less chaos in the morning, a more relaxed start. Um, there are in fact some adults who don't like getting up early um, and so benefit them as well. Um, so I, I think there are a lot of reasons to do it and a lot of, um, a lot of issues which you've identified which are to, to my mind all manageable. Um, so I, I want to encourage you to to adopt the change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Mrs. Williams. shocking. I don't even have a high school student and I have something to say. Um, this has a ripple effect that I want the committee to um, really think about and be thoughtful about this when they make a decision. Um, I'm a Birch parent and I'm in Nick's kind of area where he lives on town and I have to tell you that the traffic that um, coming from probably Grove Street and heading towards Birch Meadow by the Y to get over to Coolidge into the high school is a nightmare. This is the most congested part of town. So this really needs to be thoughtful. It needs to be, there needs to be a ton of discussion about traffic patterns before this. This can't just be a, okay, let's change the time and let's, let's vote. The um, piece that I haven't heard about that's making me a little frustrated is that the YMCA is right there. And most schools, what happens is the parents drop off, you know, 812, 815, and then they fly over to the YMCA to get parking because there's no parking over there and then you have the Birch parents trying to drop off at the same time and Nick I'm sure you live this reality it's really really tough over there um, and then you add in high school students who are going to be trying to get to school on time um, and the other thing that is um, you know, I want to mention is that with Birch, you know, when I'm standing there at the end of the day for pickup, I see high school students walking over for pickup and they're grabbing the kindergartners. There are some parents in this town who have kindergartners and high school students and they pick up those kids, they walk them home. Um, and one of the biggest pieces which really needs to be thought of um, is rise. We have to remember that we have special education students who start at 830 in this high school. And I have firsthand seen students um, high school students fly up the back of the building and almost run over special education children who have no safety awareness whose parents have let go of them and they have gone flying towards the street and car and it's it's a recipe for disaster so if we're going to shift this start time that needs to rise has to be a really big discussion with this so thank you Oh, and I just also wanted to tell you that um, there's also a contingent of parents that should be here from Parker, and they're not, and it was, I got a message saying that that should be mentioned, because there's a concert tonight. Mm -hmm. um, doctor, did you want to respond to I, any of that? I just want to talk to the, the RISE piece yeah. here at the high school. So we've, we've already had those conversations, and RISE, if, if the school committee supports this, we will be changing the RISE time next year. There are any other comments on this topic? Yep, you can come to the mic and state your name, please. Hi, 
Hi, I am um, Dr. Jennifer Corwin. Um, I'm a board certified pediatrician um, and I practice here in Reading. Um, I'm also a Reading resident and the mom to two future Reading public school students. Um, I'm here tonight on invitation of Assistant Superintendent Kelly who had asked me to come to speak briefly about the evidence um, behind the delayed school start times. Um, the, she actually summarized quite well in her presentation. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics believes that insufficient sleep for adolescents is a significant problem, um, so much so that the body released a policy statement in 2014 recommending delaying school start times for both middle and high schools to no earlier than 8.30 a.m. Insufficient sleep is not a new problem, nor is it a problem solely for adolescents. However, adolescents are more at risk for inadequate sleep than the general population. When puberty begins, adolescents experience a phase delay in their sleep-wake cycle, meaning they experience a later time of sleep onset and morning-wake time, a shift of up to two hours compared to pre-pubertal sleep cycles. This is due to two factors. One is that melatonin, a hormone responsible for the onset of sleep, is secreted at a later time during adolescence. And two is that the sleep drive, or the pressure to fall asleep after many hours of wakefulness, accumulates more slowly during adolescence. Mm -hmm. These two factors result in adolescents finding it much more difficult to fall asleep before 11 p.m. However, studies have shown that an adolescent's need for sleep does not change from pre-adolescence. They typically, as we saw, still require eight and a half to nine and a half hours of sleep per night. Long story short, teenagers fall asleep later, but they still need on average nine hours of sleep a night. Biology is telling us that teenagers are better suited to fall asleep around 11 p.m. and wake up around 8 a.m. The consequences of chronic sleep deprivation in adolescents are severe and long-ranging, affecting physical health, safety, and mental health. Risks include an increased incidence of obesity, metabolic dysfunction like high cholesterol and diabetes, hypertension, and as anecdotally, a healthcare provider in Reading, I can say this is a huge problem for our population. Um, an increase in drowsy driving, other risk-taking behaviors, an increase in the non-medical use of stimulants, of caffeine, um, an increase in depression and anxiety, executive function impairments, um, and as well as lower levels of physical activity and lower academic achievement. There are multiple factors at play, not all of which are modifiable, but school start times are one factor that can be changed. Multiple studies have shown that delaying school start times results in increased total hours of sleep per night and a decreased percentage of students reporting inadequate sleep. Delaying school start times has not been shown to result in later bedtimes, but has been shown to result in increased hours of sleep per night, increased academic performance and school attendance, and a decreased incidence of depression and fatigue. Delayed school start times has also been linked with significant decreases in the incidence of car accidents. The evidence is clear that our teachers are, that our teenagers are sleep deprived and it is having a, it's having significant impacts on their health. As a pediatrician, I agree with the AAP that delaying school start times has been proven effective in increasing teenagers' total hours of sleep and well-being. Um, and I also have a letter to the same effect signed by myself and eight other area oh. Reading pediatricians, which I'd be happy to leave for the record. Could you please give that to Mrs. Engelson? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Cole. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Robinson. So I just wanted to ask Dr. Doherty. So I, you you just mentioned that that uh, rise is going to start later. I mean, rise, that, rise at the that, high school. That's just not that. That's another disruption, though. That's a discussion we should be having as a committee. Just just changing the rise time. I'd rather know that we've looked at traffic patterns and stuff before we made that decision it was no no this is rise at the high school because it gets it would start at the same time as the high school it right was discussed so at the, late, the late start committee actually but brought that up so it just because you that just because of the traffic concerns that as you know mr bobbin and others have have raised Actually, that was one of the early discussions we had, I think, with the SROs there, that that might be a consideration, that there might need to be an adjustment at the high school, and you know whether that is overall at the other sites, I think, is something that... Um, we have already made those adjustments at the other schools for RISE and actually half-day K this year. We've made those, those start time changes, so we've already done that. For this year, based on so, other factors, but if Rise is starting at 8:30 now uh, at the high school, correct? 
and what what is that going to change to? I mean, I'm just thinking that's a whole separate community that we should be getting information out to. We're going to change the rise start time. How, how what's the I don't remember what the enrollment is there. Uh, that's, At the one here, yeah, it's right. um, probably about seventy students. So I mean, that's a. We're not talking about a drastic change. We're talking about enough. A few minutes. Yeah. All of the traffic patterns, they, they, they're in five to ten minute increments. I mean, I've, I've yeah. watched the traffic patterns just like you have on voting days. And it's chaos for seven to ten minutes at each school. Every neighborhood, we're all neighborhood schools here. So all of the traffic is chaos oh. at a school for seven to ten minutes. And then all of a sudden it just disappears. So the, the whole key is, is how do you balance that in the different areas? So rise would only change by a few minutes to compensate for that change in traffic. Okay. And, and again, I think there's yeah. some things about patterns that at this site that need to be looked at. And we've been told year over year that, you know, it needs to be looked at as part of an overall strategy. So I think that absolutely well, has I to think happen. that then that that's my point. We should be looking at that in conjunction with whether we change the time. But I Why? think that that's part that would be if we vote to change the time, then that that has to those changes are going to need to be made. And whether or not committee members are you know part of those ongoing working groups, I'm sure we if there are working groups, we, we could we would be if uh, if that's appropriate. But. I think it's um, so. It was it was one of the earliest discussions with the SROs at the at the at the working group. Um, I think I think what I'm hearing Mr. Robinson say is that it's partially traffic that we're thinking about. It's also partially the disruption of the plans of the families that are dropping their kids off at RISE. Communication, so, that's what it is. And making sure that we're engaging them, too, mm -hmm. along the way and not making a decision about one thing and then saying, oh, by the way, you're impacted, too, even mm -hmm. though you had no voice. Mm -hmm. So just to make sure that we include them in the conversations. Right, to just, but just to be clear, the reason why RISE is unique from all of the other situations is because you've got 1,250 kids coming into the same place as 70 three and four year olds. So that is gonna to have to change no matter what. Right, I just, what part? Dr. Dawson. I'm just saying that I think that people yep. should know that coming into it. I don't argue with it at all. I just think that them knowing why and how it's gonna change. Yeah, I wasn't arguing with no. it. I just wanna make sure we've done everything before we make that decision yeah. and that's all. Yeah. Um, does she know other questions? We have comments? Nick. Oh, sorry, Mr. Bobby. So I, know, I know we have more business to conduct, so I won't belabor this, but I think there are a couple points that were prompted for me in response to what I heard from the public comment. And uh, First, I want to thank everybody who came. Many of them have left, but I want to thank everybody who came and, and spoke uh, at public comment. I found the comments helpful. Um, Two points, quick one quick one. Um, it, can we go back a couple slides? I don't know who has the clicker on this. Go back to the graph that looks like this, the bar graph. Mm -hmm. That one. Homework one. Yeah. Which one? So, Which one? This one? Yeah, the statistics are the same for both. Let's stay with this one. The, the number I want to go after is the same on both. Okay. So let's be clear about what we, all, what we are and are not able to do here, right? So we've heard evidence from a medical doctor and, and, and a lot of academic literature that says that more sleep is good. I'm all for more sleep in any context, especially for teenagers, and, and I, I, I think that's helpful and a sound basis for, for making policy. What we can't know, and we'll never know, and we'll never be able to control is whether that additional hour will actually provide Reading students with more sleep. What we have heard is evidence that in communities that have added an extra uh, delayed uh, start by an hour that such outcomes are reported. Right? So we're making this leap of faith that that would apply to Reading. We'll never really know. We've also heard from public comment that says, that, and, and this data tells us, that I think, a similar story, that. Students have a lot going on, and, and the fear, and, and not only did we hear this tonight, but we also heard it in the emails that we received from a number of, of um, stakeholders. Mm -hmm. 
there were con there's a there's a deep and abiding concern in all of these comments, to my mind, that this could just shift the end of the day an hour later. And, and for this to work, if, if, if our goal is to create circumstances where we maximize the probability that our students are getting more sleep as a result of delaying the start of school, I think we need to address what happens at the end of the day. And when I look at these numbers, what you're talking about, let's, and this is not a perfect analysis, but even if hypothetical school by an hour and we add an hour to those sleep numbers, hours into eight hours, right? And that's the best you could hope for, right? Considering we can't change the 24 hour day. So if we go from 24% to 58%, if I did my math right, to add the blue bars together, right? You're still at below 60%, which is lower than the elementary school. That's 66%, right? right? So we're still not achieving what I think you were trying to point out with that last bar over there, which is 66%. Two out of three kids in elementary school middle, are getting, middle or middle school, school I'm sorry, yeah. in middle school, preteens are getting the sleep that they should, at least reporting getting the sleep they should, we're still not there yet. And so to contend with the left side of this graph, which is the five hours or less, or the six hours or less, or the student with the eight hours of homework, whatever it is, I, I would, as part of this, if, if I were to uh, vote for this, I would need some assurance that we're going to cap, as a matter of policy in this district, extracurriculars ending at 9 o'clock or earlier. But if the current end times for extracurricular is 9 o'clock, I would, I would support this with the understanding that we're not going to extend extracurriculars. My priority on this committee is curricular. It is academics first. You can choose to do extracurriculars. That's fantastic. I support that. But our priority is to educate students. And I know there's a lot of education that occurs in extracurriculars. I'm not minimizing that. But I, I just, even, even if that has a ripple, an effect on extracurriculars, I still feel strongly that if 9 o'clock is the right time, if that's when extracurriculars end now, that's when they end if we extend this. So that's the first point. Second point, completely changing gears to public safety. I would also, to support this, need some assurance that a member of the police department is involved in the traffic planning, not just consulted. But I want to see physical evidence, meaning an email, and a memo, or firsthand evidence, like come. reporting, like have a police officer come and talk about when we roll this out, the police department is doing these additional things or these things that we're currently doing, we're going to keep doing. This is how we're going to guarantee public safety will not be adversely affected. There's too much at stake here. I, I along with Ms. Williams, I, I, I go to Birch Meadow as well. That's where two of our kids go. I, I see the traffic crunch that we have there. And it, it, it scares me when I look at the traffic patterns. If we're putting all those high school cars and, and the teen drivers and the late to, late to work drivers and the late to school drivers and all those drivers together on the road with kids who are kids, I, there, there's a significant risk here. And I don't want to miss that and, and have an unfortunate outcome. Okay. Mrs. Kelly, could you just go to slide 31 again for a minute? I, I just want to highlight. So, um, I think I agree with a lot of the things that Mr. Bobbin just said, but I would like to say that I, I don't know that 9 o'clock is the right, you know, time um, to say that everything should end. And certainly, you know, comp competitions and games and matches are yeah, a little bit more uh, You wouldn't be able to, yeah. Difficult to control. Yeah, you practices can't. you can, but in Right, practices but. and, oh, this one. Yeah, so I just want to highlight that this is, I think what we're asking for is, you know, you've highlighted a lot of these things. We're, we're talking about it. I think Mr. Bobbin's asking for, let's make sure that, you know, we hear from the police department, from the police chief, to my mind, that they are really on board with this and they're going to lead this and, and they're going to bust down some barriers that haven't been busted in a number of years. So I definitely uh, feel strongly about that. But I also want to see, I, I think that we need to, you know, let the um, team and, um, Principal Boynton talked about, you know, looking at the schedule, looking at homework, and working with uh, our uh, AD, um, Tom Zaya, and uh, Lena Williams in guidance is certainly a key part of all of these things, as she's probably the person on the front lines that understands the stresses that our students are under, whether those are coming from the curricular, the academic, because I sit in the same place, or whether, you know, that combination of curricular, homework, um, parental expectation, uh, their own desire to participate in sports and drama, and uh, so I think you know there's a number of things that we need to commit to to make sure that 
they, I think um, it was sort of the ecosystem that is, I think you said, the science around sleep, that that's real, but we need to arrange these other aspects of the ecosystem um, so that they support this and they, they take that all in. So I do that. But, and also I just want to echo thank you to people who were here and um, I tried to count it up, but I think we, we got about, um, about 15 emails from people and it's evident people took a lot of time to write um, their thoughts and their comments to us and, and, and uh, um, speak their minds. So I want to thank them. Um, we have one more agenda item that I would like to endeavor to start because um, we have a packed agenda on the 20th as well. So, um, Dr. Darty, are you ready? We can sure. start where we have the uh, superintendent's goals this evening. So in your packet, in your packet there are two uh, sets of goals. And um, to set the context, this is an annual um, part of the evaluation process. It's actually the uh, beginning steps of the superintendent's evaluation process where the school committee uh, reviews the goals that have been set forth um, by the superintendent for the, the upcoming year. There are, there are actually two pieces that the school committee uses as part of the evaluation process when referencing goals. The first one is the district improvement plan, which we, um, we are now in our third year of the district improvement plan. That you have already voted on. Um, so the, those are there in your packet this evening for informational purposes and have been updated to reflect um, where we are. Um, the other piece, which is the piece you're going to vote on this evening, is the what is called an educator plan. The educator plan, every licensed educator in Massachusetts that is in a public school has to have an educator plan, including the superintendent. Um, the school committee's role in this is that they approve the superintendent's educated plan, just like a the superintendent approves the educated plans for all of the people that he or she supervises. The principal uh, approves the educator plans for all of the teachers um, that they supervise. So this is all this is all part of the same evaluation process that is in the regulations uh, with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So that's the context of what an educator plan is. Um, at the end of the year, when you do my summative evaluation, um, and all of you have done it before, you give a rating for each of um, the goals, both in the district improvement plan and in the educator plan, as to progress. The educator plan, although it is for this year, is a multi-year plan, the way it has been set up because goals are never, ever, ever done in one year. And when you look at these goals, you can see why, that these are multi-year goals. These are things that currently are being worked on in this district. Um, one of them is actually connected to the district improvement plan, so it's like the arm to the district improvement plan and, and goes all over those pieces. But other ones refer to things that you heard about earlier this evening, um, which, was the capital plan, and that there are several items in the capital plan that impact schools, and those are things that are currently happening in our school district, not just for this year, but over the next few years, and that that would be part of the superintendent's educator plan. So what I want to do is I just highlight each of the five goals that are here, um, not go over them in great detail because I'm hoping that you've read them already, um, but just to explain the, the why. So the first couple of pages. Um, you just make like reference the page number. Sure. Yeah, okay. So I'm on my educator plan right now. Yeah. I'm not uh, on the district plan. Yeah. So the first couple of pages, pages one and two, really just talk about the overview of the cycle, which is what I just did, and the district improvement plan 
uh, four focus areas, mm -hmm. uh, which you, uh, I'm sorry, four action plans, which you've seen in the past. The first goal, which is a student learning goal, um, which is aligned to all five action plans of the district improvement plan, basically encompasses these are the things that um, not only myself, but other members of the central office team and principals are going to be working on in relation to the, the district improvement plan. So you can see there that you see the action steps, the supports and resources from the school district, the timeline or frequency, and then um, the status. Originally it was the status as of 1030 because these mm -hmm. technically should be do done by November 1st. but. Um, they, we had to move this process to, to tonight. Um, the second goal, um, which is a professional practice goal, it's aligned with focus area E, is an extension of last year's, one of my lab goals last year, um, is, a, is really focused on a communication goal. Um, which is an area that in my evaluation last year was brought up with the committee is an area that I should continue to uh, strengthen and work on. So that's what goal two is focused on. You'll also notice that some of these steps have already been done, and that's because I've been working on these since July, um, after my last summit of technically my next cycle started July 1. Um, the third goal, is focused with uh, is connected with focus area D in the district improvement plan, which is social emotional learning, um, and this really is the physical and psychological security of our schools. So, as you know, we've been working diligently on our school emergency operations plans. Um, those were all revised this summer. Um, this also includes attending workshops and drills and participating in panel discussions and also working with um, facilities, Gail um, and the town uh, with safety audits and um, also the safety and security uh, capital piece of uh, the capital plan. So that is goal three. Goal four is really working and developing a multi-year capital plan to upgrade and improve school facilities. So many of the things that Mr. Huggins and Mrs. Dowd talked about are in this goal. So as you can see, that's why it is a multi-year goal. So this includes the elementary planning and enrollment study. It um, also talks about the um, safety and security study, um, and it talks about the athletic um, fields that are under the care and custody of the athletic fields and facilities are under the care of the custody of the school committee. And then the fifth goal really is a building capacity goal of our staff. Um, and that's aligned with the uh, four of the five focus areas. So this, this again are things that we've already begun doing, which was reorganizing central office roles. Um, getting all of central office staff into one central location, which has not been the case in several years. Um, restructuring some of the different roles of the chief financial officer, the assistant superintendent, director of student services, um, and activities plan to um, build the capacity of each of the sectors um, that, have I, that I have been identified. Um, so you have the operations sector, the teaching and learning sector, the student services sector. Um, and then connected to that is also the building of the capacity of our building principals and remainder of the district leadership team. So those are the five goals. Um, which, as you can see, are connected to our district improvement plan as well. Mr. Robinson, yeah. make sure to refer to the page so we yes. can follow. Yes, uh, so on this here, I just like it, kind of a, on page six on the key. So what, what, of all of those, those things, John, what do you think is working? I, I, curious how the office hours are going. Uh. The office hours seem to be seasonal. So right now it's kind of slow. Um, 
I do get a combination of teachers and um, parents, but the, the attendance is, you know, visitation is sporadic. Um, during budget season, it does tend to pick up, and we do get much, I get much more, we get much more um, traffic. Um, so that, you know, it's seasonal. I think it depends on the topics at hand. And so, Mr. Go ahead. No, um, I just was so lo just looking at that um, on the walkthroughs. Is that um, I know for some educators that can be the most difficult thing because uh, to make sure that you do. But um, so I'm just wondering. I think that you, you execute on that pretty well. So one of the, one of the things I so. Um, and we've had actually a lot of discussion as a district leadership team recently about how can we make our time together more effective and efficient. And we've made some changes even at this point in the year, um, and we're going to be making some more changes. So uh, one of the things that I, I, I used to meet with every administrator every week. And part of that, so I would go to the buildings and would would be meeting with them. And the, the intent of that was so that, you know, if they had concerns or problems that, um, you know, those would be the, the opportunities to have those discussions, um, unless obviously it was an emergency and then, you know, we're, we're all available. What we've decided to do is for the new principals, that will be a weekly meeting for veteran principals, unless they choose, it will be a bi-weekly meeting. The first half hour or, or less will be to address um, any, any agenda items that we either one of us have, um, and then the second half hour is to go in to do classroom visitation. So um, the goal is that it, at least every two weeks to be in classrooms in every building. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it'll be weekly, depending on the building. Yeah, I, just, yeah, I did, did have another. So uh, on that goal to uh, on page six, the goal num action number seven, I mean, we're already doing that. Right? Isn't it the budget parents? Is that what that budget is? Budget liaisons, yeah. Budget, yeah. So how, why does that become a, a new, new uh, I mean, that's, that's something. It's we not do. a goal, it's a step. It's one of the steps that match the goal of communication. Okay. They, all of these steps aren't new things. I mean, they, some of them are things that we've been doing yeah. in the past. Uh, Dr. Doxon. A couple of things. One is we Can you were the page? Um, just a comment on page six about what Mr. Robinson was just discussing at the conference. That was like an, oh, wow, you do that? You have budget liaisons. And people were scribbling down the idea, planning to go back to their own districts to do that. So. Mm. Um, I think it's really a, a tribute to our administration that they do it now um, and that people are involved. You just, We've your comment. We've been doing it for 15 years. Yeah. Right, and we have, and okay. it's yeah. an assumption that everybody does it, but they don't. Yeah. Um, and it's been really helpful here. Not many communities could say they had passed their overrides last year either. So um, mm -hmm. it's just a point of pride that we're doing that. Thank you. Um, on point four, um, attend at least one school council, et cetera. Um, we have a group of MECO parents who are really trying to get very active and get empowered and learning and, and wanting to find ways. So I'd love to add MECO to that list of meetings to go to at some point to give them a chance. Yeah. So uh, just, just as mentioned, um, Kate Boyton and Jason Cross and I have talked about that, um, and we would love to start the planning process of hosting a meeting um, in Boston rather than here. We haven't done it um, in a long time, um, but we're, we're definitely in the process of that. As you know, the high school PTO doesn't meet often, um, so it, it might be a, an additional meeting, but we would love to do that. And we do have a very involved um, Reading resident contingent that I think would be excited about that possibility. So we're, that's definitely, it came up at the uh, Medco conference that I went with uh, Jason a couple weeks ago. We had a retreat, um, and he, I know he's involved in the conference tomorrow, but it's definitely on our radar. And, and John will be part of that process, of course. That's awesome. I remember years ago yeah. going to that meeting. Um, so on page three also, I was looking at the um, measures of progress 
there. Um, and under the social emotional learning, I'd love to suggest that there are a lot of negatives, a decrease in discipline referrals, a decrease in student activity anxiety. They're not really negatives, they're positives, but it's written in a negative way. Um, I'd love to add to that other increases that are happening. So there are an increase in student reports of hateful acts that people are getting involved as upstanders to intervene and, and making sure that those are also um, considered um, an increase in students feeling empowered and exhibiting upstander behavior that's sort of in the same category. Something really countable is an increase in stu student involvement in peer leadership programs, um, presentations, outreach, whether it's with RACASA or MVP or AWOD, student council, community service, mm -hmm. that those are countable things also. That if there are more kids getting involved in those kinds of activities, that's through the message of social emotional um, learning and would help them. Um, and then also an increase in staff engagement with empowering and supporting youth. I know that's already happening because we have more AWOD group, a world of difference groups. Um, we have more peer, peer leader groups. We have the MVP and MVP, um, something violence prevention. I'm trying not to it's use It's the game changer program. The, the game, game changer, changer program. Um, so we do have um, staff that have stepped up for those. And they, that's a sign that people are getting involved in positive ways. Um, and also, um, I put down an increase in cross-discipline curriculum materials that encourage problem solving, history, current events, community conversations. And a couple of examples would be the courageous conversations, would be the conversations about swastikas and what they mean in history classes. Those are all evidence of what you and our administration have been changing in our schools in the positive way according to the mission and your, and your goals. So, so I, I totally agree with everything you're saying. I don't know if it belongs here. Because as you know, I provide for you every single year a significant amount of evidence. Right. That's where that would fit in. Right. That's we already have, I think, too many measurable things here. Mm -hmm. I think to add more, that, that would create, I think, a, a bigger capacity problem. Right. I, it, these are, th I, that's where evidence comes in, which is also a part of the, of the summative evaluation process. Okay, so I guess then my suggestion would be, because sometimes I think we get caught up in just what you provide, and these should be amongst those things that you the, provide for us the to look is, at. I didn't, right. The evidence has always been very exhaustive, though, so yeah. I think it's good to say these are some things that you'd want to see in that evidence. Yes, that's what right. I'm saying. But the evidence has always been quite exhaustive in terms of what you provide to, to show uh, accomplishment and progress against the goals. Absolutely. I just think I don't want these things to be minimized. I think these are important things, important evidence towards mm -hmm. the achievement of these goals, so I don't want them to go unnoticed. And, and there are many ways to achieve the goals, and these are amongst them. And they take a lot of time. So there might be some of the other things that, that aren't happening exactly as written, but then there are these. So, you know, there's all a balance there. Yeah. Mr. Bob? Well, I've watched these documents mature in my time on this committee, Dr. Darty, and one of the things that I note here favorably is, is this, these um, tables that you've added. Page four is the first example of one, and we can start there. Um, you, all goals in our district, and I know you apply this, Dr. Darty, to all, all of your team, need to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so adding this detail in your action column and the status and the frequency really addresses, in my mind, the specific and measurable and achievable time-bound components. And I, I really like that, and you've done that throughout. That, that's been a recent addition, I think, that you've, you've added since I've been on this committee. So I appreciate that. 
Um, and and would, uh, we, we, should, we should keep that, I, I like that approach of having action items that we can both look at and say, this is what the superintendent is accountable for. Um, and the other piece of accountability, so that's, that's an action-oriented piece of accountability. I think this is very strong on that, the, the process of if you take these, if you complete these actions, you've, you've met the goals that this committee has set. Um, the other way of assessing here is what I see on page three, and it's different. It's an assessment component. Right, so going back to page three, that's some older, that's some language that originated in the superintendent's goals before that table on page four. It goes back farther. And we see here a list of what I would consider assessments from different sources. There's test scores that students take, there's survey responses, and there's internal statistics. I think those are the three sources, mm -hmm. right? And one of the things that I've always struggled with at evaluation time is whether the superintendent and the committee and these different are, are, are different members of the committee are reading this assessment language in the same way when we get around to doing the assessment right in, of the superintendent and so for, let me just give you an example of this the, the way part a closing the achievement gap small a a decrease in achievement gap on state and local assessments between and it goes on right and it has a series of, of identified assessments and, the, and this pattern continues throughout the page right so the simple question I have when I sit down to evaluate the superintendent uh, in my role on this committee is, does that mean that even if one of those assessments doesn't go in the direction we want, that that's a failure to comply with that entire goal? Because we heard in the way the state assesses us now in, in Ms. Kelly's presentation, right, that they have, a, as I understood it, this, this new system where if, you're, if certain metrics of your district go down even a little bit, that's not an improvement, and therefore it's considered not compliant with the goal that, that they would like to set for our performance mm -hmm. as a district, right? Are we taking the same approach to the superintendent? And if so, we need to be clear about that. I, I don't think that's the right approach. Mm -hmm. But I could read this language reasonably to require that. Mm -hmm. And so I, and this gets to my next point, is, is, is there, there are some ambiguities baked into the way this document is written. And it's been a working document for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Among a different, and, and the committee has changed with, you know, over that time period, right? We've, every year, two seats on this committee are up for election. Sometimes people return, sometimes they don't. Um, we have turnover on the committee. I, I am not going to vote against these goals, just to be clear. But I'm not happy with them because of that ambiguity and because they've, they've kind of been a document that's been a work in progress. So we set out for these three years goals and then we've changed them as the committee has changed over time. Um, but these are the goals that this committee voted on three years ago as three years goals. Mm -hmm. And these are the goals that the superintendent has been working toward over the last three years. To, so, so for me as a committee member to say, nope, I, d I disagree with what prior committees have set out for the superintendent, and I, I, I think we should maybe the announced move the goalposts on the superintendent in the third year of a three-year plan. That doesn't strike me as good governance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. I want to say right now that I'm categorically strongly opposed to multi-year goals for any superintendent from a committee because the committee changes every year, potentially. The public has a chance to elect new people to the committee every year. The committee can change for other reasons. So this is the last year, and therefore it's a one-year goal, right? Because now we're in the third year of a three-year set of goals. So what I finally came down to when I thought about how to approach to this part of tonight, I finally came down to said, well, Nick, this is the third year of a three-year plan. There's, you know, we've been working towards this. Let's, let's not try to change something that we've been working towards as a committee for three years. The third, it's a one-year goal, which is what I, what I would like to see. Mm -hmm. So going forward, I would like to see a reset on, instead of just kind of for next year for 20, this is 1920, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So for 2021, I would like to see this committee just, just do a fresh look at goal setting for the superintendent with the goal to be clarity of interpretation and, and a one-year time-bound uh, approach where we can evaluate the superintendent. And it's okay if, as the superintendent said, a lot of these goals are big goals. They take multiple years to, to work towards. I am perfectly okay with voting the same goal year over year over year because it's, it takes multiple years, right? But I want to have specific progress. The other thing I don't like about multi-year goals is, is there's the opportunity to say, well, we, we only got one-tenth of our goals in the three-year plan done this year, but we really can't assess 
a three-year goal plan, progress on a three-year plan until the end of the third year. And so we, there's the potential to say, as long as there's activity toward the goal, particularly on the assessment side, even, even, if, even if the assessment metrics we've set out aren't being met, let's wait till next year, let's wait till next year, and you put yourself in a position in that third year where you say, oh, man, we're way off, we didn't meet the, the goal, and we should have acted two years ago, but we didn't. It, I also want to avoid that. I'm not saying that's where we are. I'm just saying I don't, I don't want to even have the potential for that, that kind of situation. So uh, I'd like to see one-year goals. At, uh, I like the action plans, and I think we can hold you know, the superintendent accountable to this. I think um, that's, so. that's a discussion we have in June, though. That has nothing yeah. to do with, mm -hmm. uh, right? Well, right now, right now it's a discussion we could have tonight about changing these goals. I mean, we have to vote on them, right? But. I, what I'm saying is when these goals I, are finished, when we're done with these goals, we're setting goals for the following year, it should be one-year goals. Dr. Doherty. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the, there are two things here. Mm -hmm. There's the district improvement, which actually by statute has to be multi-year. Yes, no, I know that. Well, that, not, that's, what you're, but that's what you're referring to. Because no, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the superintendent's goals are, there, there's different ones. There's a student learning goal, and then there are practice, professional practice goals, right? There's five, there's five goals. It, and then you have four professional practice goals for a total of five, correct? Yeah, there's five, yeah, there's five goals, yeah, right. So there's, but, there's two types. But what you're referring to here is part of the district improvement plan, which by statute has to be multi-year. That, and that's, that's fine, but it's the eight. goal number one above eight. it, eight. Right, right, so the interpretation of that for evaluating one individual is what we're talking about tonight. I agree, I agree. this is, district improvement plan is a, is a separate conversation. It's multi-year by statute and, and there's a rubric that we follow for that that is not in discussion tonight. Goal number one, however, is no. There's no. There's no rubric that you follow for the district improvement. I, I get. I get evaluated on everything. Correct. Not just my goals. I get also evaluated on district improvement. Plan. Correct. That's correct. But but you get evaluated every year. Correct. But the district improvement plan has to be multi-year. I know. But we're not evaluating the district improvement plan. We're evaluating the superintendent, and that's done every year. No, but you evaluate me. You give me a rating on the district improvement plan goals each year. On the achievement. On your performance. On the, on that the correct. Yeah, that's that. that's part of my okay. summative evaluation. I yeah. completely agree. And what I'm saying is, is the the goals for the superintendent need to be one year at a time goals. They they in in the case of the goals relating to the district improvement plan, as I said, they would need to be. Re repeated, you would assess progress toward that district improvement plan one year at a time. So if I could continue the context that I was given earlier. Um, the whole basis of the educator evaluation system in Massachusetts is that you do have multi-year goals as an individual educator because you want to show that you have a direction, a vision of where you want to go. Almost every educator in our district has multi-year goals. Mm -hmm. Those goals are also fluid. They can change based on situations, based on circumstances, based on available funding. Um, those, all of those things do change based on data that's available. Um, you know, a lot of our principals this year are focusing more on math because the data is showing that math, you know, we need to do more work on in individual schools. So. That, that is fluid, but it is also meant to be a multi-year goal. Your school improvement plans, which our, our principals are evaluated on, are multi-year. Again, by statute, mm -hmm. they're not one-year plans. And it's again to show a direction, a vision of where you want to go as a school or a district. The, the individual educator goals are also meant to be multi-year because that way you are continuing to build upon things that you are striving to avoid towards, which are connected to your district improvement plan. It's all supposed to be interconnected. I think that at the end of the year when you're evaluating performance, the issue is what has the progress been? What's the evidence and what's the progress against that goal, right? And, uh, and is the, uh, you know, the achievement level that was targeted for that year on that multi-year goal is that is that enough? And I think that's that's the difficulty of uh, with the multi-year goal. And I think 
that's why you know you have to, you provide the evidence and the context and you know what Dr. Dox was saying earlier is sometimes there may be some things that initially you put in the plan specific actions that didn't occur but there may have been other things that became more important throughout the year and those were accomplished overall we have to rate was the pro given all of that right was the progress against that goal what was expected or you know what our what our assessment of that progress is but I, I think Nick if I this on page three I thought initially that one of the things you were trying to get at was like if you just take closing the achievement gap right there's three things there so the question is when the evidence is presented on the uh, where the, the progress this year on those three things and where we end up one one thing is um, you may there's no there's no like percentage and I'm not and I'm not suggesting that we should do this because we do this at work and I don't think it is actually that helpful but all I'm saying is uh, these three items, I could be weighing them slightly differently in terms of the pro, the, pro, the the weight that I put in those three than than any other member. We all could be because we don't we that calibration between us as we do that. So I you know I don't know if as we get to you know when we're doing the performance assessment in June, maybe this is something we just talk about as we get close to that time to say how are we going to make sure we're a little bit more calibrated on that and and that we understand that but that that is a, an area and I think Nick was then saying you know um, just even how do you rate it, it, making your judgment on each item in terms of you know what is that progress level so it, I think that it's a calibration in, in issue amongst the readers and it might be something that we could do a little do a little better at preparing the committee for in the June time frame just in terms of how are you balancing all those inputs? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Do you have a motion? Yeah, Dr. Doxer, can you read the motion? Sure. Let's move, get that on the table. Move to approve the superintendent's goals as presented. Second. 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 Um, do you have any other questions, Mr. Bobby? Yeah, so I think it's important that the committee be clear. In my mind, what we're voting on is not just the high level goal, goal mm -hmm. number one through five. And to Dr. Bedardi's point, I get that there, this whole process is heavily regulated. It's not like we can just do whatever we want here. So we're working within, as Dr. Darty pointed out, a significant amount of state oversight, I'll call it. Not, to, not on Reading, per se, but on all towns, right. right? So I'm looking at this as not just the high level, I'll call them high level goals, those first paragraphs that you see starting on page three and page six, et cetera, that say goal number one, two. I'm also looking at the helpful tables mm -hmm. on page four and six yeah. and the like. Right. I'm voting those too. Yes, yes. Right, and that I'm, whole, I'm saying the superintendent's accountable. The and that's, even though it's not labeled goal, it's, it's it, well, planned activities, right? But I view that as part of the goal, even though it doesn't say goal on yes. top of the page. Okay, yes. so yep. what I'm voting, I'm voting on, these, these are for me sufficiently smart, Right, mm -hmm. specific and measurable, etc. Yeah. No, that's the goal. It's referring back to the goal, but I mean, it, I just want to make sure that, we, right, that, it, I, that we're aligned on that understanding. Mm -hmm. that, look, I'm, I'm voting on the whole package here, meaning the goal number one is page four, and we can amend these as a committee if the superintendent wants to come to us and say circumstances, you know, oh, yeah. have changed and so forth. I'm, I'm receptive to that conversation and, and to the extent it, it furthers the ultimate goal of student learning. Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't want to do things that are you know, not optimized for that end. Right, but these are the actions, not just a suggested right. list of activities. These these are part of the goals, and that's important to me to vote mm -hmm. for this. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the the sorry. The other thing that I want to say about just interpreting how I want to make sure we understand how this is understood. The communication goal, to me, I guess it's goal five. Is it two? Is that where it ended up? Yes. I was looking on that. Six. It's yeah, so, so there, there are three groups there, the staff, parents, and community. And I would be looking in these, not just at the actions, but as the goal of ultimately improving or pro, you know, having the ability to, to get some feedback from each of those groups. So staff, including educators and administrators, parents, 
uh, and community. So it's not just information going out to those groups as I read this goal in this action plan. It's some kind of evidence that those outward bound communications are received and viewed as helpful in accomplishing the goal, right? Not just, right, you're asking I disseminated about. information in an organized way. That, that's part of it, but that, hey, that information was structured and delivered in a timely way that was helpful and allowed us to do whatever the intended purpose was. So I wanna see that feedback from all three groups. As, that's what I think is part of this. Ms. Robinson. I just have, you said I just had a question for No, please uh, go ahead. Yeah. So back to the communication goal again mm -hmm. on uh, number, and I know these are activities that uh, on number eight, the uh, survey. So that was the survey we did last June. And we're Our plan again is to do it in 2020. So what, okay, so then that would actually, that doesn't even really need to be there though, right? If it's going that will be in our next, when? It's a multi-year goal, so that, I put it in there to show that. So there's no real, there's no, there'd be it no doesn't impact. It's not year. gonna impact anything we talk about when we do your evaluation. No, it's, right. but it, the pride survey we're doing every two years because of the cost associated with it. We're doing it on the off years of the YRBS. To that, this is one. Yeah, to that, to that point though, you have accomplished it once. We did it in so, June and I presented it already this year, yes. Right, so I'm saying that in Part terms of, of your, um, you know, it's planned, it's already, it's also completed and planned. The yes, the purpose of the one we just did was, a, it was a baseline. baseline, it was a baseline, yes. Right. And we didn't have the pride survey results this time around, when we just did the... Uh, right, the last review. The last review. Because, yeah. right, it right. was done in June. I, I mean, this committee is already... Later had, than when we, yeah. The committee already has data that will help them evaluate at the end of next year right. you you have MCAS data already you have accountability data already um, you have pride survey data I, I, I think it's just it might be helpful to say that this is the three year that it was completed in June of 2018 right it's planned for May of 2020 but it was completed June of 2018 is that true on the pride survey yeah. That's yes, but I don't forget saying. the high school wasn't done until September of this year. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I, so okay. that was September right. of this year. So it just might be helpful to, I mean, that would be in the, in the evidence, but I can see what the, right, it's, it, 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 it still belongs here, but it's already been completed this year. Well, I, I thought that was there because it was the column to the left, that it would be in the budget for FY20, and the FY20 budget is part of, what the superintendent will put together for us yeah. this upcoming year. That's why I thought it was there, not oh, because the, the action cost, was there. Right, the, that, the that's survey. what I thought the oh, goal was. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I, yeah, I mean, at the top of each page, it says during the eighteen nineteen school year. Um, is that the right year? Uh, We're in eighteen nineteen school year. Yes. Yes. So during right. this year. During this year. All right. Mm -hmm. So that was my question though. Why are we putting stuff in there that's not gonna happen during the 18 Be Because it needs FY, well, because in, in Because of the funding? The funding, maybe. Because in, in this year, this budget, which we build for FY20, you need the resources for the 2020 mm -hmm. survey. But again, it's also to show that the goal doesn't have it moves forward. There are mm -hmm. there, there are other pieces attached to the goal that go beyond this year. Mm -hmm. That was the, the whole right. purpose when of it. Right, when you present your evidence, the evidence is gonna include right. the pride survey result, you know, for, that was executed this September, last June and this September, but this in this school year, for this evidence on your performance review, it would include the pride from September. Right. Yeah. So, um, so the one thing that I will be very sensitive to under these goals when I evaluate on them is I would be very sensitive to situations where items are in these plans that we that we approve and they're not acted upon at all. Mm -hmm. To me that strikes me as a failure. Like if it's in here, it means there'll be some action 
this year on this. It doesn't have to be to complete it, but if, 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 it's, if it's listed here, it's because there's something to do this year toward that action item, right. or so, it shouldn't be here. Okay, so, and this is one of the things that we, you, you could say, then say if there's something that shifts, that during the year, something shifts and this thing is not going to get done, are we, then you, we could, Dr. Hardy could come and say, I need to revise this goal, and this goal is going to be, and we do this at work, right, this is going to be canceled and moved out to a future year, this is the other thing that's going to be in. I mean, I, I, we've not done that. I don't know that that's... Well, yet. one goal that will be significantly impacted by decisions made beyond this group is the capital plan goal. So there may be some things that will not happen. It's all going to be dependent on actions that are taken by town meeting. Right, I don't And know. other bodies. So, which words? Right. Generally, what we've done in the past is as the evidence is presented, you look at that and you say, okay, yep, yeah, this is, the, you know, this something didn't pass town meeting. The resources didn't come through. The goal can't continue to be executed. Now, the question is, is it, sh should we engage in a process whereby, let's say that happened, that subsequent to that town meeting, we, you can bring, just it doesn't have to be the whole thing, but look, on this goal, I'm changing this. And I want your approval. And maybe you know, if we need to, to look at that. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to understand what what you're putting out there. I know at, at work we we tend not to do the adjustment during the year. We tend to do it at the end of the year and say, right, yeah, we know this goal got moved out because those resources didn't get approved. You did this other stuff, okay? You know, that worked on the goal in a different way. But I, I just this is a public trust. Mm -hmm. This is public money. And so I think it's important that we have a very transparent process, and as, as part of that, that it's clear to everybody what this district is prioritizing and doing through the leadership of the superintendent. And, and the superintendent, in fairness to, to his role, um, that he has clarity around what, what we're asking of him. So I don't, I just want to, I'm eager to avoid situations where we get to the end of the year and we say, well, I know that was in, I know, I know that was in the, the goal, but it's a multi-year goal, and I just, we just didn't get to it this year. If it's in the, if it's in this plan that we vote on, then you're going to expect some it's in the plan, mm -hmm. and if you change it, the public can decide what they think about that. Well, if he, if he needs to right? change it, we we can do it, decide. but the public will decide what they think about that. Mm -hmm. So, John, I just want to make sure I understand the capital. Uh, so the only thing that really hasn't gone past town meeting is the turf two situation, correct? No, you have, several, you have several steps no. in here that are... But we've already, we've already gotten approval for the uh, design study, right? Mm -hmm. That's one of them. That would require town meeting approval. Uh, the security, I thought that was our that already went through town meeting, correct? The, the initial design. The design phase. The design. Yes. I, I, I guess um, I think yep. you've done more than you. I think more has been done than you're you're indicating here, uh, where it says planned. I think some what of the page, page so, ten and eleven. 11. Right. Well, some some of them have complete steps already. Yeah, some on the first page, the first. The side back side is, is page, a lot of planned. Page ten has got quite a few complete, but then page eleven has got. I think for um, Chuck, for page eleven, that was sort of next phases. So it was once we get the design, it's moving it forward to get the approval of the actual. If we if we come to school committee and school committee says we agree we're going to move forward with turf two or we do not agree yeah. with turf two it's sort of the next phase once we come forth with our proposal of what we want to move forward with that's the next hurdle from a funding standpoint and that's the pieces that we're trying to be distinguished if that helps with what's on page 11 was kind of we'll do the design we'll propose it then it's almost out of our hands a little bit as to whether or not it moves further down the process. Part of, I think, to piggyback on, on that, part of this is to tell the story of where this is going. That's part of the reason why goals are developed is 
you want to show where is this going? Mm -hmm. What's where, where is the end of it? Yeah. And so that's why you see multi-year steps here, not just the end of this year. Right. I think though that the curve two wasn't even on this time last year. It wasn't even on anybody's radar yeah. screen. Correct. Correct. It wouldn't have been on this document. Correct. Uh, so. Yeah. Bob. So a quick question about the language on security. I, I, I like these areas. I like this goal three, page eight. I like that. I just wanted to suggest some alternative language to see if what I'm thinking is what is intended. So it says to improve dot, 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 the security of our schools, right? Are, are we really trying to just identify and implement best practices for school security? Is that what we're doing? As opposed to improving, so so if we're state of the art in some areas, there's no need to improve. I don't, I don't, I don't ever want to say we're state of the art in school security okay. because of just the changing yeah. nature of of what happens. Fair, fair, fair. But are we trying to identify and implement best practices? Is that is that what we're doing? That the, the way the process would work, that would be part of it, and then it becomes what fits within. I, I think to say you. Best practices can come with a cost that may or may not be achievable. I think it'll be a multi, a similar, it'll be a multi-phased approach working with many options, many alternatives, and ultimately what the funding will support. Mm -hmm. So oh. I think trying to put a definitive word as best practice or state of the art might be difficult because be best practice may or may not be achievable well, across added, all areas, if that makes sense. That no, makes a lot of sense. Saying, you're just looking to say to like improve and move toward I mean, best do we practices? need improvement? I, I, I mean, yeah. we've heard yeah. presentations, but <laughs> obviously we, I think there, we there's always, always I, think, I think we can always improve. Yeah. And so we're not pointing to a deficiency. Yeah. We're, we're pointing to we're going to invest effort to, to remain at a safe level for mm -hmm. our community. Absolutely. Do we run that? Like, I'm sorry, just. Yep, Mr. Robinson. Thank you. So that, especially with that one, I mean, if we start wordsmithing that, that's something that I'd be running by legal counsel because anything ever happened, God forbid, this right. is all discoverable uh, stuff. So. You know, we start saying state of the art and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I just, mm -hmm. yeah. just, I don't know. Do you, do they look at uh, these things? Does uh, legal, legal, legal look at My goals? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. All right. Are we ready for a vote? We have a motion on the table. It was seconded. Sorry, oh, one last thing. I one promise this is the last one. Um, the whole area, it, it's, it's in the plan, but it's not called out as a separate goal, and that's just the area of an instructional best practices, I'll call it. And I just want to, is that what's meant by, in, is that part of goal five, specifically for action item four, the assistant superintendent's role, curriculum coordinators, et cetera? It's actually goal one. Instructional leadership, best practices, making sure that all students are progressing toward whatever standard they, they should be working toward. Improvement that. of instruction is goal one because that's the district improvement plan. That's where that's where we've been focusing our time and energy the last three years mm -hmm. is how do we improve, how do we increase the toolkit that every teacher has in this district. So the improvements we've seen, and let's just take one example, and we heard a presentation about using Fontas Pinnell reading benchmarking in grade school. There's great presentation. I think we made, from what I've heard from the presentation, a lot of progress toward having far more, and I think progressing toward all students have being appropriately tested, assessed, and, and, um, and supported. That progress from, say, even two years ago when I joined this committee to now, where does that fall? It's in the district improvement That's plan. That's number one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it would it's under like literacy A and yeah. those things. That's, okay. So that's, that's what that's goal one. The, the the whole strategic reason why I put goal one there is it connects me back to the district improvement plan. Mm -hmm. That that's the whole reason for that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great. All right. Call for a vote. All those in favor? Four zero. Uh, I think we are done.
So I need a motion to adjourn. I motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Second, are you guys? Second. Uh, second, all those in favor? Four zero. Excellent, thank you. So we're gonna avoid sleep deprivation. Yeah.